I was babysitting my brother's girlfriend's kid, who is three, almost four. We were eating in the kitchen, and all of a sudden, he started to have a full-on conversation with no one. I jokingly said, wow, you have a lot to say. Who are you talking to? He then just stared into the living room, which happened to be completely dark at the time. He stared for a few minutes, which made me feel pretty uneasy. It was probably a kid's active imagination, but my brother works at an old cemetery, and we always joke about what would happen if a ghost ever followed him home. Maybe that wasn't such a joke after all. When my daughter was about four, we had just finished her bath. I had her on her bed, drying her off. All of a sudden, she said, Daddy just said, hey. I was taken off guard because my husband worked second shift and was not home at the time. I said, no, baby, daddy isn't here. She said, no, daddy just said, hey. Then she looked all weird and got scared. She didn't want to be in her room anymore. I don't know if it was my reaction or response that made her that way or not, but it sure gives me chills and creeps me out. I called my husband just to calm my nerves and make sure he was okay. Either way, that was still one of the creepiest things a kid has ever said to me. Years ago, we used to babysit my baby cousins. One day, we were trying to get Vivian ready to go home, and we couldn't get her to focus on getting her coat on. She kept turning to look at the front door. Exasperated, my mom asked her why she was staring at the door. Vivian answers, I want to wave by at the man's. Why they dress like Halloween? I wave at them. And then she waved at our front door before saying, they gone now. Still creeps me out thinking about it. Off, I'm first off, I'm currently 51 years old and this still bothers me to this day. I have quite a few stories throughout my life to share, but this is the first. I was living in a new state, which I had never been to before. This was in the era where our parents told us to go out and play and be back at dinner time. I was nine years old in 1979, and we had just moved to Dallas, Texas. I was playing outside by myself, and I was approached by another young girl. She seemed normal and asked to play with me. I was okay with it. She asked if I wanted to see her playroom. I didn't see any reason not to, and I followed her. Mind you, we lived in a townhouse that looked like row houses, so we went into her townhouse, and I never saw anyone in the house, just the two of us. The townhouse looked normal enough. We went upstairs and into a bedroom that looked like a little girl's room. She walked up to the wall and pushed a panel, which opened. She crawled in, and stupid me, I followed. Inside was this amazing room full of toys and a little black kitten she was holding. I was so taken by all that was in front of me, and I was just excited to play. We played for a bit. However, in the secret room, there were no windows or natural lighting. I couldn't tell what time it was. Eventually, I felt uncomfortable, like I needed to get home, so I told her I had to go, mind you never once asking for her name or telling her mine. 
But she turned to me with dark eyes and asked me by name if I really wanted to go because it was fun here in the room. I was creeped out because I know I didn't tell her my name. I crawled out and she followed me. I just kept moving down the stairs to the door, trying to avoid looking back. But once I opened the door, I did look back, and to me she looked like part girl and part skeleton. So I ran home as it was dusk and I knew I was going to get in trouble. I didn't say anything about it to my mom. I went about my evening and slept like normal. But the next day, I was disturbed by it, and I decided to go back and see if she was still there. When I walked down to the town home, it was boarded up like there'd been a fire there. I stood back and looked at it for a while, knowing that I had been in there yesterday, and it looked normal. I never saw or heard anything about that little girl again. I wish I had told someone who could have found out if she ever lived there. To this day, I can see that hidden playroom like it was yesterday, and I have no explanation. I moved to the United States from London with my two boys, three and four years old at the time. Their dad stayed behind. Trying to explain the new situation to my youngest, I said, we don't live in London anymore. This is our new house. We live here now, you, me, and your brother. Yes, he said, and Yazin. Who's Yazin? I asked. The dead girl. He kept referring to Yazin for two to three weeks until I finally said, please tell Yazin she cannot stay with us and needs to go to the light. He just says, okay. And we never heard about her again. I was around eight or nine years old and I was staying with my grandparents. I had this dream one night that my granny had given birth to me, but before my mom was born, a middle child. I told my granny about this dream and she said, huh, tell me more. In the dream, I was a little man child. I was born to give them wisdom and to guide them through their lives. I was born to help them, to be their peer, I remember being really confused about this, about being their equals. I found out years later that my grandma had taken a child to term, and the child died in childbirth. About two years later, my mom was born. I guess in hindsight, that was a really creepy thing I said to my granny, and I'm sure it's the story she tells when people ask her about creepy things a kid in her life has said. Sorry, granny. My nephew didn't say this to me personally, but he did to my sister, repeatedly, for about a month. At the time, he was about five years old. Every single morning, he would ask my sister why the lady with blood on her tries to make him take her hand at night and come with her. He would tell her to leave him alone and cry, and she would say, shh, 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 shh like a mother comforting her child, all whilst holding her hand out and asking him to come with her. Freaks the hell out of all of us. At a house that I used to live in, my room was upstairs and creepy stuff was always happening. One night, my little cousin spent the night with us and wanted to sleep in bed with me. There were knocks and noises, 
and the next thing I know, she's laughing. I asked her why she was laughing, and she told me, stop tickling my feet. I never touched her feet. I took her downstairs and we camped out on the floor that night. I never told her what was really going on. I told her it would just be fun, but there was no way we were staying up there after that. I keep a photo of my grandma and I on my nightstand. She was the most influential person in my life, and she died when I was 12. Once, when my daughter was four, she said, that's your granny, Barbara Jo. I'm named after her. I responded that she was right, and I asked her who told her that. She says, she told me when I was in your tummy. One day, I was walking by my nephew's bedroom. I thought I heard a noise, so I got a little bit closer, just to listen in and make sure everything was okay. I heard him whispering, so I stopped and opened the door a bit. I said, who are you whispering to? He said, no one. Just as I started to walk away, I heard him whisper again, but this time, I heard what he was saying loud and clear. He said, shh, she's gonna hear you. Totally creeped me out. So I work with kids and one of them comes up to me and he asks me if I have ears. I'm thinking that's kind of an odd question, but I say, yes, I do have ears. He goes, if you have ears, then why can't you hear the people asking me to play with them? I stare at this kid in shock as he walks away. I was like, what do you mean? But he never answered me. That really freaked me out because all the other teachers that I worked with there were convinced that the building was haunted. Up until that point, I didn't believe them. But after that, I don't know. Two months ago, I purchased this doll. I found it at a Goodwill store, and I purchased it as a Halloween decoration. Ever since, I've got some really off-putting issues going on. I started to notice whenever I had it out, like when I bought it and set it on my dresser, I would have nightmares. And I just had this weird feeling, so I would shove it in the drawer when I woke up in the night. One night, I had sleep paralysis. This happens to me every now and then, but this was the first and only time it ever involved another person. In my sleep paralysis, as I stared, paralyzed at the wall, I heard a voice say, Wake up, you two. I instantly got chills and eventually was able to get up and realized that I had put him back on the dresser. I've never been so scared. Even with all of this, it still felt like a fluke or just me psyching myself out until tonight. Tonight, my family and I were moving out. For three months, we'd had some dry flowers hanging from a pot rack in the kitchen. I pulled this puppet out of my drawer because I was emptying it, and I put it in the garage. At 6.50, we left the house to take the second truckload. Nothing abnormal. At 10.12, we got back home to find the flowers that had been in the same place for months on the floor. I told the people who helped me move. Later, my cousin sent me a picture he had taken of the puppet. I didn't realize they were playing and messing with him downstairs. When I looked at it, 
I realized that the flowers had fallen almost if not exactly where my cousin had taken that photo. Please advise. Maybe I'm just psyching myself out, but this is really weird. My nephew, who was two and a half at the time, sister and her husband used to live in my house. One day, my nephew was looking out the window and sharing his juice with the window. His mom asked him what he was doing and he said something about sharing his juice with the man. My sister assumed he was sharing with his reflection and didn't know the word for boy, so she brushed it off. He then began to show off his dino slippers. No big deal. Next day, he's back at it, except this time he says the man had his horses and was scary. She looked out the window, nothing, and no horse-related items in the room at the time. As she's looking, my nephew runs over and begins to cry, saying the man was scary. His dad came home later and shot the bad guy away with a Nerf gun, and he never appeared again. This is really weird because both my sister and I, the only two of us who have ever slept in the front end of the house where this happened, used to see this scary looking man out of the other window wearing a cowboy hat. My sister even found a dog tag with info on it about a man. We looked up the information though and found nothing of use. I don't remember anything written on the tag. We live in a fairly big new neighborhood and there were no local deaths. It was really, really odd. My three-year-old, who is normally very happy-go-lucky, was extremely concerned the other day. He kept looking around the room, talking about the rhino. Who knows what a three-year-old might translate as a rhino. This went on for about 20 minutes, and he was very concerned and looking around the entire time. So we get to a point where he says, the rhino is moving. My wife asks where the rhino is, and he just says, he's coming to daddy. He, yeah, um, I'm daddy, and my ass puckered just a wee bit after that comment. Fast forward about four days, and he starts talking about the ghost. My daughter asks my son, where's the ghost? And my son says, he's biting daddy. What the actual hell is happening? My son used to tell me about he and his sister and how they died in a basement when they had a different mommy and daddy. He has two sisters, so I would ask him which one, and he would always say that it was a different sister named Claire or Clara. It was hard to tell which one he was saying. He would go into detail about their dad locking them in the basement, how they heard gunshots, and how the fire would come and they couldn't get out. He would talk about it being so hot he couldn't breathe and really smoky, and then he would fall asleep. He was only three or four at the time, and every time he would talk about it, he was so consistent and very matter of fact. He hasn't talked about it in a few years though, and he doesn't remember anything about it when I ask him. A few years back, I was babysitting a little girl who was around four. I'll call her Emma. So Emma was a bubbly child, very energetic and always laughing. 
She also happened to have an imaginary friend named George, with whom she played constantly. But she never really mentioned him, other than to tell me and her parents who she was playing with. One day, as she was playing with this George, she suddenly turned to me and said, George doesn't like you. I was startled and asked her why he didn't like me, but Emma only repeated what she'd said before. I asked what George looked like, and she said that he was very tall, with a red face and an eye patch. I, of course, got creeped out. Fortunately, she never said anything like that again, but I would sometimes catch her whispering to herself as she stared at me, only to resume playing when she saw that I caught her. Every once in a while, I'm asked, what's the creepiest thing a kid has ever said to you? And this is always my response. My son used to say things like, in former times when I was older, usually followed by something older people would say. He would say things like, in former times when I was older, we would have to wait for the milkman to bring the milk. When he started school, we had to tell him that maybe this wasn't the best thing to say to the other kids. He said it so regularly and casually that we were a little bit worried about how the other kids would react. He stopped saying it altogether when he turned 10. I have no idea if he has any memories of these events. I babysit two kids frequently. I had them in the kitchen eating their dinner and I needed to use the restroom. So I went across a small hall to get to the stairs. The girl who was seven at the time thought I was out of earshot. And she says to her brother, wouldn't it be funny if Emmy fell backwards and cracked her skull open at the bottom of the stairs? There would be blood everywhere. It creeped me out more because she thought I couldn't hear her. The boy told me he heard scratches and growling inside of his closet one night, which is why he refuses to sleep alone to this day, and that he had also seen shadow figures, quote, the size of his dad, who's about 6'2". Their home is creepy. I've been with these people for six years, and I also dog sit for them when they go out of town, which is frequent, and take it from me, their home is definitely haunted. When my daughter was three or four, she was downstairs at my in-laws while we were visiting. There was a playroom down there with dolls and things like that. We were upstairs in the kitchen when she came up and asked, is it okay to play with great grandpa? She said it like she was asking if she could play with her dolls. At the time, she never had a great grandparent and had never even heard the term before. The thing is, her great grandfather died in that house about 30 years prior. My kid is six years old and literally says weird things all the time. He has a sleep walking and sleep talking thing going on. The pediatrician says he'll grow out of it. Anywho, he likes to sit up in the dark and say things like, tell those people to get out of here. I'm trying to sleep. Or my personal favorite, mom, who is she? Why is she looking at us? while pointing to the empty wall next to the side of the bed. He also likes to get up and sprint into the dark house in the middle of the night. So that's fun. I 
At the age of 18 months, my son would point to things. I totally believe in the paranormal, so I brought out pictures. I pointed to Papa Spiller, my husband's grandpa. I have video of him giving Papa his pacifier and waving by. He also started talking about his other parents, Papa Fisher and Mama Joe. They were murdered, Papa, then Mama, and then him. After he was shot, he was in my tummy, and here we are. He's now seven and doesn't speak much of it anymore, but he would randomly say things like, Papa liked those, or in his sleep, he would casually mention needing help on the farm. Let me start by saying that growing up, my little sister never slept in our room as a child, like ever. Normally she would sleep with my mom due to her freaking out about one thing or another. To be honest, it made me feel a little bit uncomfortable about sleeping in there by myself, which I did every night. Her constant freakouts about it, coupled with the feeling of being watched while I was in there alone, even in the middle of the day, made me feel super uneasy. That being said, there was one night that I came home from hanging out with my boyfriend at the time, and I walked into my room. And who do I see? My little sister. At the time, she was five and I was 15, and she was totally fine and in the top bunk. I was incredibly surprised that my mom got her to sleep in her own bed. She looks down from her bunk and points to my great-grandmother's rocking chair. It was then that I noticed that it was slightly rocking back and forth. She laughed as she pointed and said, look, it's grandma. I immediately yelled for my mom to take her and the rocking chair out of my room. My great grandma had died a few months before and my sister barely knew her. Without pictures, she wouldn't even know what she looked like. It was so creepy. I have always hated my best friend's grandma's house. My friend has lived there off and on since we were probably five. At one point, she was staying there with her oldest daughter, who would have been about three or four at the time. Her daughter would draw pictures of the man and talk about seeing him in the hallway. The creepiest, though, was one night when a few of us were sitting on the porch, one summer night. One of the girls was getting ready to leave, and my friend's daughter said, Laura, you don't have to be scared. The man is in your car right now, but he's not going to hurt you. We couldn't see anything in the car. Instead of leaving, literally all of us went inside to give the man some time to vacate the vehicle. When I was in the first grade, I had just moved to a new foster home. I started having this nightmare every night about the devil doing really bad things to me. I remember him bringing me into his room. I remember everything. It's still vivid in my mind at 19. The weird part about it is I had an aerial doll that would move around my room ever since I had started getting this dream. It had a button on the back that would make her sing Sometimes I would wake up with her singing on my bed when I remember putting her somewhere else. Ever since it started moving around, I have started putting it in places that I would absolutely remember putting it. On my bookshelf where my teddy bears were. Even in other rooms. But every single day, for months, when I had that dream, she would be laying somewhere else. Most of the time, in my bed, singing. The last night that I had the dream, 
I woke up to her walking toward me, on my bed, singing. I freaked out and ran out of the room. It's always insanely vivid in my head, and I only started telling people as an adult because I didn't know how to tell people when I was a kid. I have no idea what that was, but it still affects me to this day. So when I was like seven or eight, we used to live in Webster, Wisconsin, and we lived in a house a little bit wider and longer than a trailer house. No upstairs, just the base floor and a basement. It was a beautiful house with a big area that was just woods. One day, my cousin was supposed to be watching my two sisters and I, and he said that we could all go play outside as long as we stayed in his sight. But within five minutes, he ran into the woods and told us to keep up. Of course, we listened to him. We ran after him, and he disappeared. We couldn't see the house or even the tree line where the woods stopped. We were lost, and we started freaking out and crying. Then about a half an hour later, a really tall Native American chief came up behind us and asked us what was wrong and why we were crying. Asked if we were okay, things like that. I told him how we'd been chasing my cousin and we lost him and we don't know how to get back home. He just smiles and says, Don't worry, sweetheart. I'll make sure you get home safe and sound. Just come to my village and rest for a little bit. Eat some lunch, play with the children, and when you're ready, you can explain to me where you live. I said okay, so we go back to his village and it's a smaller one in the middle of the woods, in a clearing, but it had at least 60 people. We ate a stew or something like that that they made, and he had me draw in the dirt on the road where our house was. He smiled and said, I know exactly where you live. If you want to play for a little bit, that's okay. But I want to get you home before dark. There are a lot of dangers in these woods, like bears, coyotes, bobcats. Not good for children to be out in. So he took us home, and he didn't leave the edge of the woods. My mom came out crying, asking where we were, saying she was about to call the cops because we were missing for about four or five hours. She asked us why we left the house without Scotty, my cousin, and I said, he was with us. He ran into the woods and left us behind. We tried to call for him, but he was gone. Then he came outside and said that he had never left the house. He thought we were in our rooms. So I told my mom what happened, and she said we would figure it out the next day. The next day, we went and followed our footprints and found the village, or what used to be a village. There was almost nothing there. What had been a gorgeous place was now ash. It had all been burned down. The grass, which was shorter the day before, now stood taller than me. It looked like it had just been burned down and left vacant for hundreds of years. We called out for them, but there was no response. We found the chief's headdress and a doll made of deer hide and some other kind of cloth. As we were about to head back, I found a huge eagle feather the size of my arm. It was the most amazing paranormal experience I've ever had. It was around 10 p.m., and my friends and I decided that it was a good idea to play hide-and-seek at 11 p.m. So when we started to play, I ran into the middle of the forest, where I hid. Around a tree, I saw a woman in a white dress, just staring at me. Obviously, I got scared and ran outside of the forest. On the way out, I got a cut that was about three or four inches long on my left hand. I only saw it when I was clear of the woods. When my friends got the balls to do it and go in there, they saw her too. We all ran to the highway, which was about 200 feet away. The night passed and we didn't play anymore. 
but I had a camera at home, which I didn't use anymore. I decided to put a 128 gigabyte SD card in it and place it near the tree that I had hit around to let it record anything. When my friend went to get it, he said that the woman appeared on the camera until 3 a.m. when she suddenly disappeared. Unfortunately, we have since lost the footage, but either way, it was a very scary experience. My boyfriend and I went up to his parents' cabin a few years ago. We were the only ones up there for the weekend. We went on a short hike up along a creek known as the Strawberry Trail. We were about a half a mile up just enjoying the beautiful scenery. We embraced in a hug and we both closed our eyes as we did so. But as soon as we did, we heard this loud flapping of wings or running of some large animal. It was so loud that we could feel the vibrations and a sort of wind that came with it. It felt like the animal or thing had stopped right in front of us. I was so terrified I kept my eyes closed, but as soon as I opened them, we both looked around and there was nothing there. We didn't hear it leave, and trust me, we would have. We were spooked, so we booked it back to the cabin. I will preface this by saying that I have never seen a ghost. I believed in them in my youth, and I'd been rather agnostic about my beliefs for a long time, simply believing that anything could exist. The older I got, however, the more skeptical I became. But this happened last night, and I can now firmly say that I'm a believer. My friends and I were in a local park last night. We were walking along a trail. And right away, something was off. One of my friends has always experienced the paranormal, and he was extremely uncomfortable. He said he was seeing figures and hearing footsteps throughout the extent of the walk. My other friend and I couldn't see out of the ordinary, so we kind of laughed it off and said that he was just scared, which I now regret doing. It wasn't until we sat down at a tree that things took a turn for the worst. Both of my friends reported feelings of cold dread washing over them that I did not feel. I assumed they just had anxiety. Then my ghost seeing friend stared at the tree line. I asked him if he was seeing one and he said yes. I looked into the woods and I saw it. It was a small wispy figure that had a white gray coloration and seemed to be made out of smoke or mist. It was in constant fluid motion, inverting into itself as if it was barely staying visible. It would bend from just a smoke ball to a small humanoid figure, not childlike, just small, and it would wave. I pointed at it and I asked my friend if it was between the two trees. He said yes. I described what I was seeing and he said, oh my gosh, you see it too. We ran out of there after that. I felt the same dread that my other two friends felt, and I could not shake the feeling for the rest of the night. It's all I can think about now. I mean, what was that? It didn't feel like a dead person. I mean, it didn't feel like a person at all. It also didn't feel like it was mocking us. More like it was trying to act in a way that was abnormal for it. Like it was trying to be human. I don't know. I'm an ex-skeptic that's now begging for answers. My friend and I both saw the same thing. And all three of us felt the same thing. So if you have any idea what that was, I'm all ears.
This was back when I was living with my mom, aunt, and brother. We lived in a townhouse. It was like a large house with a smaller house inside of it. My aunt owned the house, so she was alone in the larger house, which was two floors, and my mom and I lived in the smaller house. We shared the bedroom, and my brother lived in the basement. One night, my mom was in the living room watching TV. I couldn't tell you what show, but she really only watches old sitcoms, so it's a dead giveaway that this couldn't have been the TV. My brother worked as a landscaper, so by this hour he was almost always fast asleep. Our bedroom has an outside facing wall, facing the very large fenced in backyard, and behind it a small stretch of woodland bordered by a reservoir. There isn't any room for anything larger than a coyote to live there, and nothing larger is native to the area, considering that we live in the suburbs. There are mountain lions a little over an hour north, but wolves and other predators are not native at all. Around 1 a.m., I heard this blood-curdling scream. Before you say anything, yes, I am aware of mountain lion screams, and I've listened to them extensively, but this was absolutely not a mountain lion. It wasn't a fox either, or any other animal that I could think of that we have here, but I'm open to suggestions if you think you know any. It goes on for a good 10 or so minutes, while I lay paralyzed with fear. It sounds almost like children screaming, except deeper and more terrified. It genuinely sounded like someone being killed. The next morning, I asked my mom about it, and she said she didn't hear anything. My brother said that he did, but he thought that I was just up watching TV, or that maybe my aunt was fighting with her boyfriend. My aunt thought it was my mom having a temper tantrum. To this day, I don't know what it was, and though I don't live there anymore, it still makes me very afraid. About three years ago, I was on a family vacation to Eastern Washington, and a central aspect of our trip was visiting Lake Paragon State Park. It's in an extremely rural area with a tiny western town about a mile away, and that's it for miles. We had just arrived for our 10-day stay in the afternoon, and it was now around 11 p.m. My mom and I left our hotel to go down to the park as she was really into photography, and the moon was full. If you're not familiar, eastern Washington as a whole is very desolate, and so the night sky is generally incredible, no light pollution. There were no clouds to be seen, and we were a ways down a dirt back road, over the park, above the campground with no real roads anywhere in sight. We got out of the car and took some pictures, with nothing more unusual than the eerie silence. About 15 minutes into our visit, we were both facing away from the moon, looking at the rolling hills, and we noticed an odd concentration of light on one hillside about a quarter mile away. Before either one of us could point it out to the other, the mass of light shining on this hill rolled away into nowhere. It took two seconds and was entirely gone. The whole hillside was brightly lit up, and then, nothing. We freaked out and got out of there as fast as humanly possible. We both saw it. There were no other people, no moving clouds, and no roads from which headlights could shine. I still have no idea what we saw. So, I'm an avid caver from West Virginia, and there's this cave not far from me that's been one of my favorites to explore. It's often my go-to cave to take friends and newcomers to to get them into caving, as it's rather easily accessible and not too challenging of a cave. Although, 
it is a rather large cave system. The first thing to note is that there's never any wildlife seen in or near the cave, and I've only ever seen a few bats for as large of a cave as it is. Anyway, the first really strange thing to happen was that my friends and I stumbled upon a pentagram made out of salt with a dead bird in the middle, circled by what seemed to be freshly burnt out candles. Obviously it was freaky, but we took it to be a prank by some teens or something along those lines. I've always been very comfortable going through this cave and leading treks, but up until now I had always been with a group of friends. One day, I decided to take my girlfriend through, so just the two of us went. We didn't make it past the first chamber, because I just had such an uneasy feeling. It was as if I just needed to get out of there. My way of describing it is the feeling of being watched, but on steroids. I've been in some sketchy places, but I've never had that sense of dread in all my life. The next thing to happen is that a group of us went back in and stumbled upon a newer looking jacket far back into the cave that was never there before. I wouldn't have taken it to be so odd, but it seemed to be a rather expensive jacket with no apparent damage or reason to just leave it laying behind randomly far back in this portion of the cave. There was also nobody else around at this time. The next thing to happen was when a group of us friends were exploring and on the way back out, one of my most serious friends just seemed really strange and off. Finally, I asked him if he was good and he nodded and quickly told me to just keep moving. Once we got out of the cave, he pulled me aside privately, which is really not like him, but he told me that he didn't think it was a good idea to go back in there. I finally convinced him to tell me why, and he told me that he swore he saw a person back there. From what he could see, a very pale, lanky person. He couldn't quite make it out at first, but he said that he noticed it following us. He even tried calling out a few times, but we didn't think anything of him doing that at the time, because it's fun to yell and make echoes. Anyway, after this experience, I convinced the same friend to go back with me, along with our other buddy, to reach an extremely difficult place that I haven't been able to access yet, seeing as I've just been taking newbies. As we arrived at the cave, there was a man and woman camping nearby who were standing at the entrance. We made a friendly conversation and asked if they were going inside. They said no, they were just checking it out. So we continued on. After reaching our goal and being at the dead end of a very tight spot, we laid and rested for a while. Then we heard people. We all heard it at the same time as we looked at each other and squinted. We couldn't quite make out what they were saying as it was very distant and echoed and muffled, but we could clearly make out that it was English, male and female voices and we heard laughter and water splashing. We thought it was pretty odd because it was in the morning and we didn't expect anyone else around but those two campers, so we figured it was them. Anyway, as we were exhausted, we rested for a good while longer and shut off our lights to save battery. We remained quiet as we were just resting and after a while, we couldn't hear them anymore. Then we went ahead and made our way back out of the cave. As we exited, the man and woman were still there by the entrance. My friend asked, so you decided to go in after all? The man replied, no, why? And we asked if anyone else had gone in or out, and they said they hadn't seen anybody the entire time. At this point, we were creeped out as we all clearly heard voices but we didn't really talk about it much amongst each other. Much later while doing research, I started putting things together in my head and realized that my friend's description was very Wendigo-esque. And then I recalled how they're very often known for being able to imitate human voices 
to lure prey, and it just really creeped me out. I almost wouldn't believe what he said he saw, but if you understood the person that I was talking about, if you knew him, he's not someone to ever make up something like that. Anyway, I hope you found the story interesting. I still don't know what we encountered, but if you have any ideas, let me know. I was big into off-trail hiking. I would usually track animals and find really cool spots to hang out, meditate, and smoke a bowl. I had a good friend that was into doing the same thing, and one weekend we decided to go hiking together, find some killer views, smoke a bowl, and talk about life. Well, we got lost. The road we wanted to take was closed, and we decided to follow the detour and see where it would take us. I should mention that we were in the middle of nowhere. The mountains are beautiful and are filled with hidden streams and waterfalls, but they are almost inaccessible due to the terrain. I have been out to the area many times and never encountered a single soul. Anyhow, back to the detour. The road should have connected with another arterial, but soon, we found ourselves on a logging road that dead-ended in the middle of the middle of nowhere. We thought this was weird, but we were like, okay, cool, an adventure. We see what looks like an old logging trail and decide to take an animal trail to the south of it. We gather up our bags and let out my German Shepherd, a rescue dog and the best darn dog that I ever had. This is important, because to get everything we needed, we had to walk around my truck. We head out about 30 minutes into the trail, and we start to feel like we're being watched. It was a bad feeling, like the kind of bad that makes your stomach drop and instinct take over. Relevant side note, I left home when I was 16 and was homeless for a while. There is nothing like a situation like that to teach you how to have eyes in the back of your head. Back to the story. The forest is silent. Not a bird moving in a tree, not a squirrel. Literally, there is no noise. It is supernaturally calm. And then we hear a stick break about 30 feet behind us on the trail. We assume that it's a cougar as they frequent these mountains, and so we kept pressing on, but the feeling doesn't pass. I motion for my friend to keep talking as I slide off into the brush and double back. I have my dog with me, a hunting knife, and some bear spray. I'm still wanting to believe that it's a cougar, so I figure that I'll be okay. As I get close to a turn in the trail, I hear some crashing in the bushes. Odd, because the forest is still silent. But again, it could be a bear, a cougar, something like that. My dog goes running toward the sound and then stops and begins growling. I figure the gig is up and I step back out onto the trail. And that is when I notice a third set of footprints, new, large, and male. I pretend that my dog is lost and then head on back down the trail to catch up with my friend. I mouth to her that I saw another set of footprints and at that time, we decide to climb higher up onto the mountain so that we can see if anyone is approaching from below. I'm pretty sure that this decision saved our lives. As we're hiking back to the car, we discover several hunting blinds. This is off-season hunting, and it's illegal, and most of the animals people really want to poach are still higher up in the mountains. But there was still warm food sitting on a plate. It was eerie as hell. We flat out booked it off the mountain so fast 
with my dog running off and growling at the person that we now know was following us. We unlock my truck as soon as we see it and grab my dog in as we're pulling away. And that's when we notice the flat tire. Someone had sliced my tire to shreds. This is when I said screw it and gave thanks for having a sturdy truck that I didn't care about. I didn't care if I ruined the car, the axle, or the wheel. I just wanted out of there. When we got down to the highway, a term I use loosely, I pull over and patch the tire and pump it full of air as fast as I can. I know that we saw something we shouldn't have seen. We made it to a gas station, just barely. Also very creepy, complete with the old man and dusty cans of beans. Change the tire and then drive as fast as we can back into cell range where we call the cops. I don't think that they believed us. I'm pretty sure they thought it was an animal, but people go missing in the woods all the time around here, especially in that area. Unfortunately, I didn't know this until I got home and did some research. That was the end of my off-trail hikes. I now only go on heavily populated trails with a group of people, and I always leave the name of the hike and a map along with my expected return time with my best friend. It isn't nearly as enjoyable, but it sure is a heck of a lot safer. Moral of the story? Trust your instincts. Tell someone where you're going and when you'll be back. Carry bear spray and your survival pack. Always have an emergency repair kit in your car, a battery charger, air pump for your tire, a patching kit, flares, and a couple of flashlights. No matter how safe and reliable you think the location you're going to is. I forgot to mention earlier, we saw the same footprints leading from the shelter down to the animal trail we had been on. There is no doubt in my mind that we were being stalked, if not hunted. In 2008, I was in the Navy. We were over a hundred miles from any land, and it was about three to four in the morning off the coast of Peru. I was an electronics technician, so I worked in radio with one other guy, a radio man, and we just sat up scanning the HF, UHF, and VHF radios listening for drug runners. We intercepted a UHF signal that played a short piano preamble followed by a haunting, computerized-sounding woman's voice, reading numbers. Eleven. Nine. Four. Six. This went on for about a minute. Then the preamble repeated, followed by the same number sequence. Then it was gone. We recorded the transmission, wrote the numbers down, informed the captain, and shortly, a message was sent off to the area commander about the strange message. The reply we received was, Disregard. Creeped me out. I came to find out that this is a number station, and while the phenomenon is not entirely understood, it's likely a method for getting a secure message or code to an intelligence agent in the field over an insecure method of communication. Since the numbers could be attached to a one-time code, it's basically indecipherable. Either way, it was super creepy. From May of 2010 to May of 2011, I worked as a security guard at a hydroelectric dam in Virginia. It was a fairly isolated location. If you needed an ambulance, you could expect at least a 20 minute wait. About a month after I was hired, one of the guys at the dam told me that most security guards out there quit after a few days because they got so creeped out being alone at the dam at night and that he was glad I was sticking it out. 
In truth, it could be creepy. Sometimes at night, when I was patrolling the basement level of the dam itself, I would think about the fact that I was 50 feet below the waterline, on the low side, the only human being in about a mile and a half radius. Sometimes I'd hear weird noises in the woods, or catch a flash of a shadow while I was inside the dam. It takes a lot to scare me, though, and I knew I was either hearing critters in the woods, or my mind was playing tricks on me. One night, however, something happened that scared the living hell out of me. It was a little after 11 p.m., and I was sitting in the guardhouse reading a book. Suddenly, I heard a tap at the door. What was creepy about the guardhouse at night was that when you had the lamp inside turned on, people could look through the windows at you, but the glare made it difficult for you to see outside. When I heard the tap at the door, I thought it was a bug hitting the glass. It was so faint, and I knew there weren't any contractors at the dam. I had the place to myself. Then the tap came again, more insistent this time. I grabbed my flashlight and opened the door. There was no one there. Then I let the door slip from my hand and shut behind me. To my left, previously concealed by the door as I had opened it, was a huge man, at least 400 pounds, wearing a gray sweatshirt and gray sweatpants. The sweatshirt was smeared with fresh blood. My heart started hammering. My blood ran cold. I was so scared I couldn't speak. As it turns out, he was a local fisherman who had been fishing off the bridge over the trail race. And he was wondering why the power company hadn't started back pumping into the lake yet, because they usually started a little before 11, and that was what always drew in the big striped bass. He was smeared with blood because he'd already caught and gutted a couple and wiped his hands on his shirt. He felt really bad when he realized that he had approached me basically in the same way that a murderer in a horror movie would have. I am thankful to this day that I was unarmed security, because if I'd had a gun, I would have either shot him or accidentally shot myself while trying to shoot him. Either way, paranormal or not, that was the scariest night of my life working that job. I lived in Germany for many years while my father was stationed there in the U.S. Army. We lived off base in private housing, and I loved it. That country is amazing. The vast forests, the mountains, the countryside, the farmlands, the little towns, everything. I quickly became really good friends with some local boys whose parents owned the town's dairy farm. We were always in the forests, running around and exploring fishing, playing army, stuff like that. I was around eight or nine years old at that time, and I'm over 40 now. One night, I stayed late at the farm hanging out with the guys. I left at about nine or ten-ish. It was dark, but the moonlight gave pretty good vision. I lived just across the soccer field, and then across a small cornfield from the farm. As I'm walking through the soccer field, I see a bit of movement just really quickly, out of the corner of my eye along the tree line at the edge of the field. I quickly stepped up my pace. As I turn to take my usual path through the cornfield to my house, I see at least a half a dozen silhouettes emerge from each side of the rows of corn on the sides of the path. I froze. They just stood there. And then all of a sudden, there's one standing behind me. Before I can snap around and get out of there, he asks in German where I'm going. I turned around, and what I see surprises but also relieves me. I answered in English and told him I was headed home. He was then curious about my English. Turns out it was a team of special forces operators. I mean, these guys were decked out so much in tactical gear, I couldn't comprehend how they were able to move so stealthily. Night vision goggles, packs, bags, weapons. There was even a dog. 
They looked like total badasses. Apparently they were using these small towns to do some off-base training. I just happened upon them this particular night. I will never understand why they chose to break cover and show themselves. They could have easily just stayed put and I would have walked right by them none the wiser. But they all walked me home as it was on their way back. It started off super creepy, but it was actually pretty cool. And it's an experience that I will never forget. I've lived in rural Massachusetts for 17 years of my life, and I've encountered a lot of wildlife in my time here. One day I was moving my mare up toward another pasture, which was a little ways down from my house, a good 15 minute walk. I tacked her up and we were making our way down the main road. The road is still very rural, dense forest lies on either side, and cars rarely drive on it. It's a perfect main road to horseback ride on. All of a sudden, my mare wouldn't keep going. Annoyed, I dismounted and decided to lead her on foot to the pasture. We were making our way around a corner when I noticed my mare's gaze fixated on something. Less than 15 feet away from us was a large black bear. As we made eye contact, my heart sank into my stomach. I was 16 years old at the time and barely weighed 100 pounds. Staring down something so large is unforgettable, and it was one of the scariest things I've ever experienced. Not only do I have this thing's attention, but I have a whole damn horse with me, and I'm on the ground, not even on the horse. Maybe I didn't act the way I was supposed to, but I'm alive, so I'm not complaining. I slowly started walking backwards with my mare, not wanting to risk anything. Adrenaline does weird things. After I re-rounded the corner and the bear was out of sight, I mounted my mare and made my way back to my house. I actually drove up with my car and managed to get a few blurry pictures of it, but nothing to write home about. I have had a lot of weird-ass borderline paranormal encounters in the woods, but nothing beats Mother Nature's creatures. This is one of the many things that I have never told to anyone before, because I'm pretty sure that nobody would have believed me, thinking that my imagination was just wild, and sometimes I still doubt that anybody will believe me. But I remember this happening for real, so I wanted to share. This thing happened to me in the past when I was around nine, and I always used to hang out with my oldest cousin, who was seven back then. We were pretty inseparable at the time, before everything changed when he turned 18. I was spending the night at my granny's house, as I used to be her personal dog sitter, and he decided to come hang out with me. He suggested that it was a good idea to go into the nearest forest, which was almost right next to her house. We were living in a medium-sized city, but the forest is almost always near buildings at some parts or areas. Around 10 or 11 p.m., we decided just to walk to the edge of the forest, since it would have been completely foolish to go deep into the forest that late. I told him that that would be a good idea, since we were both kind of bored and feeling adventurous. We headed out and just started to walk toward the edge of the forest, both up for having a small adventure. But that didn't even last a half hour before the weird things started to happen. I remember when I was standing against a big tree and looking just in front of me, my cousin was near my side, like six or seven inches away from me. I was looking in front of me and I felt like I was searching for something. I'm still unclear of what exactly it was, but I was just looking. All of a sudden, I saw red eyes staring at me from out of nowhere, but they were really far from us. I turned toward my cousin and asked if he was seeing what I was, but he ignored my question. So I turned back to look at the eyes and they were much closer than before. 
I blinked a few times, but of course I couldn't see anything around them, and they weren't getting closer. I just saw trees. I turned back to him and asked the same question, but he kept ignoring me. So I turned one last time to look at them, to see that they were even closer and closer. I just kept watching them, feeling a little bit afraid at this moment. And I swear that they started to come toward me, even when I didn't look away. So I just grabbed his hand and ran as quickly as I could until we saw the street lamps. After that, I've never seen or experienced the same thing ever again. The weirdest thing in hindsight is that I never heard it getting closer. I never heard anything at all. Even if it had been like a wolf or a dog or something like that, I would have heard rustling or branches or something. But there was just nothing. It's been 16 years since this happened, and it has always stayed with me. I'm a sheriff's deputy in a fairly busy county. Along with the job comes the unfortunate familiarity with what a decomposing human body smells like. To me, it's very similar to an animal carcass, but with a much sweeter odor. Not sweet in the sense that I enjoy it, hell no. That smell normally means a bad night for me and another gruesome memory to add to my catalog of things I would rather forget. With that out of the way, I'll get to what happened. Last night, I was patrolling a geographically isolated area of the county, which is very large and sparsely populated. Having completed the hour-long trek to the northwestern county line, I began driving through the mountains back toward civilization. About 25 miles from town, or the closest semblance thereof, I hit a straight stretch of highway through a wide valley. Since the weather was nice, I had my windows rolled down. As I passed the entrance of an old logging road, that familiar smell of sweet rot suddenly filled my car. Not just a whiff, a cloud of it filled the cab as if there was a weak old human corpse sitting in the front seat next to me. It was all too familiar, but this time there was something else that I couldn't place. It lingered for a few moments then went away just as quickly as it had entered. Realizing what I had just smelled, my heart sank and I pulled to the side of the road. I told myself it was just a dead animal in the ditch and that my mind was playing tricks on me. I turned my car around and drove slowly back toward the logging road. The closer I got to it, the smell became stronger and I grew more certain that I was about to find a body. Holding on to a shred of hope that I was wrong, I parked my unit on the side of the highway just before the dirt road. I radioed to dispatch, told them my location and that I would be out of my unit for a moment. I didn't say why to avoid an awkward disregard on a possible body on the side of the road. I shined my flashlight into the ditch and into the encroaching briars and weeds as I walked closer to where I believed the source of the smell was. Once I was a few yards away from the dirt road, I saw the opening of a concrete culvert going under the highway. At this point, the smell was nearly as strong as it had been when I first passed. The opening of the culvert was about three feet in diameter, just large enough to hide a body inside. I cursed and held my breath as I leaned over and shined my light inside. An empty tunnel stretched the width of the highway Somewhat relieved, I stood and looked around. It smelled as if I was standing on top of whatever was emitting the odor. I searched around the brush for a moment, but found nothing. Thinking the origin might be on the opposite side of the highway, I crossed to the other ditch to continue searching. As I walked away from the other side of the road, the smell grew faint. I stopped at the opposite end of the culvert and peeked inside, just to double check. The odor was nearly gone at this point. I stood up and checked my surroundings when I heard a crack in the brush behind me and the smell engulfed me even stronger than before. Thinking for a moment that the wind must have shifted, I froze 
when I realized the air was dead still. Whether it was fear or something else, a shiver went down my spine. In the distance, I saw headlights coming down the highway. As the car came near, the odor seemed to move away, farther into the bushes toward where I had heard the crack. The car stopped, and the passenger rolled down the window and asked if I was all right. I lied and told him that I was. I thanked him for checking, and I walked briskly to my car as they drove away. I got the hell out of there. Once I was able to get cell service, I called my friend who was patrolling the opposite side of the county. I explained what had happened, trying not to let on that I was spooked. Once I was done, he paused for a moment, then asked about the unusual hint of something which accompanied the smell. He asked if it was sulfur, and I put two and two together. It was sulfur that I had smelled. I asked if he thought I had found a demon in the middle of nowhere, to which he responded with a concerned, yes. This guy is the son of a missionary and has been all around the world. He has seen, rather smelled, this before and told me that it was a very concerning experience. This spooked me even more because his responses were very out of character for him. Maybe something else happened. Maybe there's some shred of a possibility that there's a scientific explanation. But honestly, I think I agree with my friend. I think there's a demon in the valley. A couple of years ago, my pops and I decided to go on a road trip. It was very out of the blue. I wasn't even expecting it, but I decided to go anyway. It would be some solid father-son bonding time. After driving for what seemed like a couple of hours, it was maybe around 8 to 9 p.m., we pulled up into this gas station for snacks and water and to use the bathroom. And we went back inside our car. Keep in mind, this gas station was basically in the middle of nowhere. Anyway, we got back into our car and decided to look for a motel, but there were none. And I mean, there wasn't a single one anywhere near us. My dad was really tired, so we decided to sleep in the car. We pulled up into this sort of resting area slash parking lot and decided to go to sleep. My dad fell fast asleep, but I was on my phone for a couple of hours. And around 11 p.m., I just felt suffocated by the tense air and I decided to step out for a bit. I felt safe because the gas station was still in sight and there would be a couple of trucks that would occasionally drive by, so I felt at ease. At this time, I was also texting my friend who lives in Seattle, Washington, and we were on the phone for a bit. Then I saw what looked like a large cornfield. I was a city guy, so I'd never seen a cornfield in real life. So I decided to cross the road and just get a closer look. So that's what I did. I walked extremely close and started feeling like I was being watched. But again, I thought, well, you're literally outside in the dark standing next to a tall cornfield. Of course you're gonna feel weird. So I brushed it off. I even considered going in, but then I thought, why would I even do that? So anyway, I decided to just take a step back when I noticed a barn, a large white barn with red, maybe black strips. It was hard to tell in the dark, but it surely was a barn. And I was stupid and young when this happened, maybe 14 or 15. So out of curiosity, I decided to just check it out. The barn was next to the cornfield, kind of tucked in a little. I literally thought to myself, I wish I could see something that would freak me out as a joke because I never really thought that anything would happen, and I love being scared. Anyway, I started making my way toward the barn. Getting closer and closer, I remember very vividly that I was wearing no socks and just slip-on slides. I remember the dirt rubbing against my toes while I walked. I remember sending pictures to my friend in Washington, jokingly saying that I saw something and I was gonna go check it out. As I got closer, I did see something. 
behind the barn, but sort of to the side, like how when someone peers from a corner. At first, I thought it was a bell. Literally, I assumed that it was just a bell attached to the corner of the barn. So I just walked closer. I kept moving toward it. And then I saw the head of something or someone just peering around the corner at me. At that moment, I straight up froze. My flight or fight was out of function, apparently, because there I was literally seeing someone or something peering at the corner and I didn't do either of those things. After about five to 10 seconds, the noise that Snapchat makes when you get a notification snapped me out of it. And I just ran as fast as I could across the road to my dad's car and got in. I felt a sense of relief wash over my body. And somehow my dad was not awake. Me gasping for air wasn't enough to stir him from his sleep, I guess. I really considered waking him up and telling him that we have to leave and telling him what I saw, but he would assume that I was joking or having some kind of episode since he's never believed in anything paranormal or out of the ordinary at all. I took deep breaths and just texted my friend telling her what I saw, but she didn't believe me. I don't blame her and I won't blame any of you either if you don't believe me. I have a hard time actually believing what I saw sometimes but I know it was real. I was sober and fully aware, but from the bottom of my heart, the part that disturbs me the most is that whatever was peering at me from around that corner was very tall, at least seven, maybe eight feet tall. And every time I think about that, I get a sense of dread and paranoia. I haven't told any of my family, not even my dad, but if any of you have a clue of what I might've seen, let me know. I wasn't hallucinating. And this was way before I figured out anything to do with psychedelics or drugs in general. I've been trying to piece it together ever since it happened. I was sort of 50-50 on paranormal encounters before, but after that experience, I believe. I believe in walkers and windigos and ghosts and everything pretty much. It's completely changed me. I want to know what's out there. I want to know what I encountered. I was on patrol one night in my town and we were told to go to some weird place that none of us had ever heard of. Cernan Lake is how it's pronounced. I haven't been able to find it on any maps after the fact, and we had to be directed by dispatch to a back road, which was barely visible from the highway. Grass had grown over most of it, and you could only see tiny gravel rocks here and there. We're no strangers to small towns out in the middle of nowhere, seeing as there's a ghetto calling itself Lake Annette nearby. Anyway, someone had reported a woman screaming inside of a motel, and two men had gone into the room and not come out. Naturally, this sounds like a pretty big deal. So we're sent out there and being guided over radio by dispatch. When we get there, it's basically just a set of eight buildings, one of which is a gas station. There were no pumps and it was basically just a house with a concrete drive-in. The motel is the closest thing to the road. A bunch of people, maybe about nine, were standing outside the motel most of the lights inside were on, and at first we didn't hear any screaming. We tried briefly to talk to the people outside about what was going on, but everyone said something along the lines of, I don't know, I just woke up because of all the screaming. Seeing as this was a potentially dangerous situation, I drew my taser, and my partner drew his service pistol in case the taser didn't work for whatever reason thick clothing, probe going off too far to one side, something like that. As soon as we open the front door to the motel, the screaming starts up again. It was incredibly painful to the ears and caused us to run to the room from which it was coming. We yelled in that we were the police and we went in. As soon as the door is open, the screaming stops, just gone. The room looks completely ransacked, scratches on the walls, no blood though, nothing seems to be missing, just misplaced or damaged. 
The bathroom was completely clean. No scratches. Closets were empty. We looked under the beds, even, and nothing was there. We poked around for as long as we felt was necessary and radioed in that we didn't find anything. We waited for other people to come out and help. We left and went back to the station and wrote up written reports. We still have absolutely no idea what happened. Investigators don't have any idea, and we haven't heard anything from the lake town since. I've been having sleep paralysis fairly frequently, hearing scratching on the walls and footsteps, as well as nightmares. None of this happened until we went there. I've been working with a psychiatrist to deal with it, currently trying Ambien to see if it'll keep me from experiencing sleep paralysis. I've been tempted to go out there again on my own time, but I haven't been able to work up the nerve. Our department can't afford body cams for everybody since we're a small town department. We can barely afford repairs on our vehicles, so we didn't get any footage. I have no idea what this might have been. I'm leaning towards some kind of elaborate prank, but it just seems odd. Like, it would have taken way too much effort to actually fake it to be worth it. We've seen the guy who owns the so-called gas station coming to our gas stations and filling up gas cans. He puts them in the back of his pickup and drives back toward the highway with him. I also asked around as the post office said that they do occasionally get mail to and from there, but it's mostly tax stuff. I haven't been able to find it on any maps. The view is blocked by trees on Google Earth, and you can't really see the turnoff on the highway. I've been having trouble finding really any official records related to it, aside from a case file from the early 90s, before I was even born, about a textbook domestic disturbance. About three years ago, I was on a family vacation to eastern Washington, and a central aspect of our trip was visiting Lake Paragon State Park. It's an extremely rural area, with a tiny western town about a mile away, and that's about it for miles. Anyway, we had just arrived for our 10-day stay in the afternoon, and it was now around 11 p.m. My mom and I left our hotel to go down to the park, as she was really into photography and the moon was full. If you're not familiar, eastern Washington as a whole is pretty desolate, so the night sky is generally incredible with very little light pollution. There were no clouds to be seen, and we were a ways down a dirt back road over the park, above the campground, with no real roads anywhere in sight. We got out of the car and took some pictures, with nothing more unusual than the eerie silence. About 15 minutes into our visit, we're both facing away from the moon, looking at the rolling hills, and we notice this odd concentration of light on one hillside, about a quarter mile away. Before either one of us could point it out to the other, the mass of light shining on this hill rolled away into nowhere. It took two seconds and was entirely gone. The whole hillside was brightly lit up, and then, nothing. We freaked out and got out of there as fast as humanly possible. We both saw it. There were no other people, no moving clouds, and no roads from which headlights could shine. We still have no explanation for what we witnessed. Everything happened this summer when I was working and living in the Chicago area. I don't know much about spirits or paranormal events, so I'll give you the facts of what happened and you can come to your own conclusions. In the first few weeks of my new job, I met this really great guy. We'll call him Paul. We hit it off immediately, and one day he suggested that we go hiking in the woods. I'm originally from Russia, so I was practically raised in the woods. I spent half of my childhood in them, and I was really excited about his proposal. 
As we're hiking, it starts raining, like pouring rain. I've never seen anything like it. We go deeper and deeper into the forest until there are no more paths and we're practically treading swamp water. All this time, we're just talking about random stuff and getting to know each other while not really paying attention to the surroundings. There's no one around since we've gone pretty deep into the woods already and it was pouring buckets. Eventually, we stumble on the skeleton of a teepee, just the bare wooden structure of it, and thought that it was pretty cool, so we kept going in that direction. Suddenly, we both hear someone crying. It sounded like a baby. It is a forest, so lots of animals can imitate that sound, like deer, cubs, etc. And the cry sounded distant anyway, so we thought nothing of it and walked forward. Within seconds, we heard this thing right next to us, which seemed strange since it sounded so far away at first. It was so loud now that it could have been a few feet away. We start looking all around, even looking up into the trees, and absolutely nothing was there. It was a pretty weird situation, so we kind of speed walked in the other direction. As soon as we stopped for a break, the sound starts up right next to us again. It was like something was telling us to book it, so we did. We ran faster than what was probably safe in that kind of weather, half looking at Google Maps and half relying on memory. We made it back to the entrance of the woods. Both of us agreed that what happened was pretty weird and decided to look into the history of the place. Immediately websites like most haunted forests in Illinois started to pop up. Turns out that the place was the site of ancient Native American burial grounds. Not surprising since a lot of tribes used to live in various parts of Illinois. And apparently it's where three young boys were brutally murdered and left naked in a ditch. Pretty dark stuff. Paul and I went back and I kind of forgot about the incident until one evening after work, he tells me that he can't stop thinking about the cry and he wants to go back to see what was there. Naturally, I think it's a stupid idea, especially because it was already dark out. But then Paul's friend Ryan joins him for kicks. And since I'm worried for both of their safety, 20 something fresh out of college dudes can be very dumb. I come along thinking that at least I could try to keep them out of trouble. So we hop in the car and we drive over there. Traffic is insane and my friend takes a wrong turn. So we get there at around 11 PM. We get out and head into the forest. Now there's no street lights anywhere near us except right at the edge of the road and flashlights can only do so much. So our visibility is pretty bad. We eventually get to a small wooden bridge that leads us across the river into the actually deep part of the forest. As soon as we cross, I start feeling uneasy. We weren't supposed to be in the woods that late in the first place, but this was a deeper feeling of guilt, like we were intruding or disturbing something that was there. Ryan, who's been leading the way and feeling all confident and cocky, saying that there's nothing out here, stops all of a sudden. On the other side of the bridge, the three of us were hit with this feeling of dread and panic one that I've never felt before in any forest, and I've been to lots, both in the day and at night. We all exchange nervous looks, and suddenly, we hear crunching, coming toward us from the dark. The feeling at this point gets so intense that Ryan, confidently walking ahead seconds ago, now looks uneasy and says, I think we should go back. We all slowly turn around and start speed walking toward the bridge. No one talks until we get to the other side. And Ryan says, I, I was just nervous because, you know, it might have been a homeless person and I didn't want to deal with that. Right. Eventually, we get to the road where our car was parked along the side. And that's when I see a girl, maybe in her early 20s, just walking along the highway. She was wearing very little clothing and looked a little strange. Her walk wasn't a drunk one. She just seemed to be almost, I don't know the right word for it, but vibrating, undulating, I'm not sure. 
But there wasn't a building around for miles, just straight road. My stepdad is Malaysian, and he's told me a bunch of ghost stories about young ghost women on the side of the road killing drivers. But I was willing to risk it because I didn't want to leave this girl all alone, ghost or no ghost. So I convinced Paul to slow down a bit when we got to her. I called out to her from the passenger window, asking if she needed help. The girl slowly turns around, and with the creepiest, slowest smile spreading across her lips, she nods. I was hit with that same feeling that I had gotten back there in the forest and almost regretted slowing down. But whatever, my sense of wanting to help that girl was greater than whatever weird stuff I was feeling. And if I died, well, at least I'd have a clean conscience. She gets in the back of the car, right behind my seat and next to Ryan, and he just starts to chat her up, flirting, asking her where she's from and what she's doing. Typical. All this time, I'm turned halfway around keeping an eye on her because I feel like as soon as I turn around and face the road, something bad is going to happen. She's keeping steady eye contact with me the entire time, even when Ryan is talking to her with that slow, creepy smile, while slightly undulating, I still don't know what to call it, but it seemed snake-like. Ryan asks her where she's coming from, and she says, oh, just around. He asks if she's coming from a bar, and she nods her head yes, except there's not a single bar anywhere even close, not for miles and miles. She said she was walking home, and gives Paul an address, which is 15 minutes away by car along nothing but forest. My eyes literally hurt from keeping eye contact with her, and she just keeps smiling and undulating and giving off this feeling of dread. This feeling just keeps increasing, so eventually we drop her off at her street. There are lots of old looking smaller houses there. When I turn back to look at her a second later, She's completely gone. I couldn't sleep that night. I kept imagining her creeping up the stairs, her smiling face undulating from the shadows. Before I tell you my stories, it might be helpful to tell you more about my background. I'm a 23-year-old boy whose family moved during the Yugoslavian War in 1999 from Eastern Serbia to Switzerland. We used to live in a small village across the Danube at the Bulgarian and Romanian border, a region that has a very colorful history. Many bloody historic events occurred on the soil where we lived, Roman emperors used to rule this area as well as many historical figures such as Attila the Hun, Alexander the Great, or Vlad the Impaler, all of which resided here once and fought battles. The region has been occupied many times, the longest used to be under the Ottomans. This occupation lasted for almost three centuries. After the Ottoman occupation, the country didn't have much time to recover and the First and Second World War had struck the country already. Many people died during the First World War, about a third of the population. As a result, guerrilla groups like Setniks, Partisans, etc. were formed, killing even more people. In conclusion, many people were unjustifiably tortured and lost their lives, which is probably why there are many occurrences of the paranormal here. Magic is also very common here, the so-called Vlak Magic, or Vlaska Magica, in Valation, is said to be one of the strongest in the world, and many people tend to practice it and religiously believe in it. As a result, there are many stories about paranormal events. One of my favorite ones is a story my grandfather told me. He grew up in the forest in a small and old house, about 300 years old. He was adopted by my great-grandfather who used to be a leader in one of the upcoming resistance movements against the socialist regime after the Second World War. He fought in both world wars and even with all this, he took great care of my grandfather and loved him as if he was his own child. 
50 years passed since he left his home and all of those people living here died, but my grandpa still visits this house and stays overnight there. This place creeps me out. Even during the day, there's an aura to this place that just makes it uncomfortable to be there. I can't imagine staying there overnight, but he frequently does. And one day he told me a very strange story. While he stays there, he says he often gets visited. At first, I thought visit like the ones you get from neighbors or something, but he told me that one night he woke up to a hand crawling over his head. It was a huge white pale man kneeling next to him and sort of crawling over his head, speaking with a calm voice in Vlaski, the dying language that we used to speak here, which is a mix of Moldavian and Romanian. He told me that his skin was white and that it was glowing in the night. He didn't have any hair and the hand felt very soft. My grandfather has always respected the dead and was never really afraid. He told me that he didn't really speak to him and just enjoyed his company, since he knew in some way that he wasn't evil. Another time, he told me that he used to fix small parts around the house. When it started to get dark, he slowly began getting ready to leave his tractor, because it takes like an hour to reach the next civilized place. While putting stuff back into the barn, he heard loud noises in the attic. It didn't bother him until a plank was thrown down the stairs. He recalled one time they even threw down a rock into the wheelbarrow that he was pushing into the barn. He told me he just turned around, locked the barn, and didn't even frown. They expect you to react, he said. Don't give them this pleasure. He told me this while laughing, then said, it makes them go crazy. Growing up, I heard a lot of these stories, and it really does run in our family, having these experiences from time to time. The scariest thing that happened to me occurred during the summer of 2009. My grandfather told me during this summer break, as usual, stories from the past of how he used to walk these woods alone in the dark and what he experienced while doing so. And since I was in my teen years, I started to question the reliability of his stories. From time to time, I took out my old motor bicycle and drove it out into the forest. Driving around was the only time I could really think about stuff and, you know, be in this type of state where you question everything and think about the world. So one day I took out my bike and decided to drive around. I still don't know why or how, but somehow I found myself driving to the old house that he grew up in. I didn't really bother to question why my intention was to drive there, so I just kept going. I always believed that I was a kid, pure by hearth, and no evil could ever come to me. While I was driving out, I thought about the probabilities of actually encountering a vampire. I live, as I mentioned, in East Serbia, where vampires are still widely believed in. My grandpa always told me not to go out past dark, but I didn't really care, so I still kept going. Remembering back, I thought that his intention was to keep me scared so I didn't get lost in the woods. But being a teenager at the time, I thought I was invincible. And in fact, even if a vampire did cross my path, that I would pass by him with no harm. There aren't really streets there, it's just a dirt road between trees that leads to what seems like nothing. After an hour, even the dirt road started to vanish. While I was driving and thinking about how strong I was, I noticed that my hand felt very wet. I thought it was because I was sweating, since this region can get very hot. After taking a look at my hand, I saw that there was blood all over it. At first I thought it might have been a bug that I had squished, but there was just too much blood for that. So I started to look for wounds, but my hand seemed perfectly fine. My heart slowly began racing, and I took a sharp turn and drove back home. I remember this to be the moment that I was the most scared in my life. I had the urge to look behind me every second that I was driving through the forest. It felt like someone was sitting behind me just waiting for me to fall down. After arriving home and telling my grandpa, he just started laughing 
and told me never to question their abilities again. When I was young, I attended the local scout group based in my village in Hampshire. The amount of things that I learned from scouts and the lessons that it taught me are innumerable, but one particular memory stands out. Once on a camp at an old scouting campsite, I remember we were playing a game at night, which was World War II themed. Our leader loved creating military themed games. In this game, each team had a bomb, a colored string of wool, that they had to fix to the enemy base, which was a random piece of rope that was put up in the woods, making sure not to get caught by the enemy soldiers, which were the leaders carrying flashlights. As somewhat of a tactician, I departed from the other scouts, who were heading straight down the main path toward the enemy base, and also toward the leaders. Instead, opting to flank around deep into the woods, which took longer, but proved to be more successful in the dark. Eventually, deep in the woods and on my way to another bombing run, I heard the distant sound of the whistle. This signaled that the game was over and that everyone should return to the camp. I began making a leisurely stroll back through the darkness. I can't remember if I was alerted by sight or by sound, but my attention was drawn to a short silhouette walking through the woods about six to eight meters away. Assuming that this was one of the younger scouts who was also returning to camp, I decided that it would be funny to try and scare them by making growling noises. Immediately after making the noises, the silhouette stopped dead in its tracks, turning toward me. In the darkness, I couldn't make out any of their clothes or features, but I could clearly see the blacked out silhouette of a child. After the figure had clearly noticed me, but not made a sound, I decided to carry on making growling noises. But then the silhouette just turned around and began to walk away from me. They were clearly unfazed by my attempt to scare them. So I figured that I would just follow them back to camp. However, after a few steps, the figure literally face planted into the ground, still about eight meters in front. I jogged a bit to catch up with them and make sure they were okay. But upon reaching where they were, there was no trace of anyone. Confused, I looked around for a short while, seeing if they had scrambled off. But there was no noise of someone running away, and I didn't notice them get up. They had just vanished. Still in a state of confusion, I continued to walk back to the camp alone. I didn't really tell anyone until years later when it clicked in my brain that things just didn't add up. Something else that sticks in my memory from that camp, which is probably unrelated but still strange, was that part of the woods had been cut down and the grounds heavily churned up by some sort of heavy duty machine. Whilst exploring this area, some of my friends and I found an old leather briefcase that looked like it had been churned up by whatever machine had been in the area. Upon opening the briefcase, we found a really old scouting uniform. Think sand colored and military style with shoulder lapels, with quite a few loose badges and some other personal items that I can't remember. I don't know if it was related to the boy or not, but it's still kind of strange. I live in a super rural area and walk my dog outside in the dark every night. Tonight, I was walking her later than usual and things felt very off. First, we went outside and I walked no more than two feet away from the door and felt something wet under my foot. I checked my shoes and there was a slug in the middle of my shoe. It didn't look like a normal slug, but I don't know what else to call it. I have no clue how it got there, because I know it wasn't there when I put them on. As I'm trying to figure out what the hell is in my shoes, 
my dog starts freaking out and growling at the house across the street. She does this somewhat commonly because they have dogs that attacked her once. So I didn't think much of it and went inside to get another pair of shoes. I walked back outside and was immediately struck with the feeling that something was wrong. The first time I was out, I heard weird, quiet music, but just thought that the neighbors were playing something. This time, the music was gone, but there was this incessant, high-pitched shriek periodically. My dog and I literally stopped, just stopped, and stood for like a minute, listening. There was this periodic shriek, and then another sound, like a high-pitched bark, Definitely not a fox, I know that sound, and none of the dogs in the area bark like that. This sound would happen every now and again. The worst part was that everything else was dead silent. If you live in the country, you know that it's never silent, not even in the winter. I took a recording on my phone of the noises, but they weren't super loud and it didn't pick them up very well. So I'm feeling a little weird, but I get scared easily, so I try to brush it off and let my dog go to the bathroom. As soon as I stop the recording, my dog starts flipping out, hackles raised, growling, barking, and jumping at something behind us in the yard. She didn't have to tell me twice, so we ran to the door and inside the house. I shut the door behind us and immediately felt relief. I felt like I was being chased, trying to get to the door. My dog ran around the house and did a check out of the windows to make sure everything was clear, I guess, and then went to bed. I don't know what happened, but it scared the crap out of me. I'm hoping that I'm just being paranoid. telling this story for 80% entertainment value and 20% feedback. This is entirely true. I'm not a spiritual person. I'm resistant to energies and vibes, though I do believe that there are others who are more tapped into their surroundings than I am in that regard. And I'm a cynic with most paranormal things, except Bigfoot. I believe in the Squatch, but we ain't talking about him. I live in the foothills of Western North Carolina, near the base of the Blue Ridge. I lived in the mountains for a few years and hated it up there. I despise the woods with a burning passion. Yet, just my luck, I've moved back in with my folks, in their cabin, surrounded by woods. The land my family owns stretches across about 15 acres of woodland. Now. These are the woods I grew up in. Despite my typical aversion to nature, I do feel pretty safe in them. I climbed the trees and splashed in the creek and played with stick swords when I was a kid. These woods are home, except for the area behind the backyard. Our cabin is positioned at the top of a pretty steep hill that slopes down for about a half mile before it bottoms out at a creek down in the woods. The halfway point between the house and the creek is this little patch of woods right behind the fenced in area around the house. It's always in shade, no thick undergrowth, just trees, Carolina red clay, piles of leaves, the usual, but it feels really weird down there in a way that I can't explain. I feel very unwelcome out behind the house, and I'm not the only one. My parents avoid it too. Even our pets, past and present, have always steered clear of it. I'm going to list some experiences that might get my point across better. A. I was about eight or nine, and one summer, I thought I'd try camping in the backyard. I set up my family's unused tent, loaded it up with an air mattress and a pile of blankets, copper, my beloved deer stuffy, and some comic books. 
I guess I wanted to be excited about it. But even before the sun went down, when my mom was helping me set up my little camping trip, I felt uneasy. The shady patch of woods around the backyard was just weird, but I was a kid, so I figured, screw it, I'm 20 feet from the house, I'll be fine. I was not fine. I got set up for the night, stayed up reading comics, felt like an outdoorsman, and it had barely gotten dark when I began hearing loud, rhythmic crunching in the woods behind the backyard, like something big was walking in circles around the undergrowth. We don't have bears in my neck of the woods. Besides, whatever it was, it was definitely walking on two legs. It never tried to approach the backyard, even as I sat there with copper, just listening to it. It just kept walking. I barely lasted an hour in that tent before running inside and getting into my own bed. B. My mom is an avid gardener and decided that she was going to put together four or five raised gardening beds in the backyard for herbs and veggies. This was when I was 11-ish, so naturally I was roped in to help. We spent the first part of the spring putting them together and getting them started. I began noticing that both of us would get really edgy and irritable back there. We're best friends and we never fight, but we would be snapping at each other, constantly raising that stupid garden. I also noticed for the first time that the woods behind the house are deathly quiet. Playing music or talking didn't make any difference. It was that kind of silence that presses in on you. And it's always like that back there. The beds actually thrived for a little while, but mom would always ask me to come with her when she tended to them. I thought it was silly at the time. When I got older though, she told me she just couldn't be down there by herself. She'd wait until I was home from school before checking on them because she too felt uneasy and unwelcome. Eventually, we just abandoned the project. The raised beds are still down there, by the way, just rotting away in the undergrowth. I haven't checked on them since middle school and I'm 23 now. C. Lastly, and in my opinion, the creepiest, was the time that I asked mom to cut my hair. We were poorer then, so rather than go to a salon, mom just gave me a twice monthly trim. It was late spring and warm, so she suggested we cut it in the backyard for easier cleanup. I was maybe 13 or 14 at this point. So we ventured down, I brought a stool, and I sat diligently while she cut my hair. Side note, my mom has always cut my hair, so she's very good at it. She doesn't make mistakes. This is important. As she worked and we talked, I noticed that the old familiar feeling of unease was back. We were not welcome back there. The tree stood still and shadowy, despite the brilliant sunny day. And I remember that it was cold, very cold. Mom finished up my haircut and I shook off the extra debris to let her admire her handiwork. She stepped around in front of me, angled my head this way and that, and said it looked good. Three things happened then in very quick succession. First, I felt this squeeze of pressure on my lungs, like I couldn't breathe. It was such a weird sensation that I just froze. All of the uneasiness of the atmosphere pressed in on me all at once. Second, my mom got this weird, vacant look on her face. I remember her smile fading and her eyes going a little glassy, like she was lost in thought. And then she reached out with the scissors, still making this empty expression and snipped a deep cut into the skin over my left eye. I freaked out, jumped down off the stool, 
and backed away. At that same time, the third thing happened. She seemed to gather herself again. She was almost in tears. She apologized over and over again. We didn't even bother to take anything with us as we ran back up to the house to treat the cut and stop the bleeding. I still have a little scar there and she's never forgiven herself for it. There wasn't even a hair hanging over that eye either. I had a pixie cut at the time. So, yeah, a few of the many weird experiences that make me avoid the backyard now. I haven't even been down there in seven or eight years, but now that I'm living here again, I just sometimes look into the backyard and feel that weird shudder of apprehension. So what's the deal? Why don't we feel welcome in a 50 square foot patch of land that we own? Why is it so dark and quiet all the time? I have no idea, but my parents and I, we just work around it and pretend it isn't there. Growing up, I was fortunate enough to live right at the edge of a very large nature preserve. The area was not open to the public, but thanks to the location of my neighborhood, there were several lesser known entrances that I could use to gain access and explore to my heart's content. Countless days of my childhood were spent hiking, swimming, and playing pretend with my best friend in these woods. The woods became like a second home to me. I felt like I knew every shortcut and secret cave, and I always felt at peace, except for one very unusual instance, which is the subject of this story. My best friend and neighbor, who I'll refer to as Jacob, knew these woods just as well as I did. We had several choice spots that we liked hiking to, and a couple of makeshift forts that we made out of sticks and such. Keep in mind that things were simpler back then, and our parents felt little need to worry about us. They were accustomed to us disappearing for hours on end while we explored the woods. This was also before cell phones were a thing. One more important thing to note is that these woods were once home to Native Americans more specifically, the Comanche tribe. Oftentimes, we would find arrowheads left behind by the native tribes, or ancient cans and bits of supplies, presumably left by the settlers who eventually found the area and took it for themselves. We found this bit of history fascinating, and going in the woods sometimes felt like taking a step away from the modern world and going back to a different time. One afternoon, Jacob and I packed up some water and snacks and set out into the woods like we had many times before. Usually, we would stick to the trails or the creek so that we would be able to find our way back home easily. But today, we had an urge to explore even deeper than we had gone before. We headed off the trail and into the uncharted areas of the preserve that even our parents hadn't taken us to before. Things were fine at first, but soon we realized that the trees had gotten incredibly dense. It became increasingly difficult to walk as dead tree branches seemed to reach and claw at us every step of the way. We both found ourselves a sturdy stick and used this as a makeshift machete, chopping and carving ourselves a path through the trees. There was no longer any trail to be found, but we didn't care. We were invincible kids who knew these woods well. What was the worst that could happen? We had been proceeding like this for probably about 15 to 20 minutes when we got a horrible feeling. That horrible feeling that we were being watched. Jacob and I looked at each other at practically the same moment, and he said, dude, 
Do you feel that? Yeah, I said. I feel it. We both agreed that something felt very wrong. We couldn't describe why, but we both had the same feeling of dread that someone or something was watching us. We quickly agreed that it was time to head back. We turned around and started making our way back, but after several minutes, we started having doubts that we knew where we were. The woods were dense here, denser than any part of the preserve we had seen, and it was nearly impossible to move. We were getting tired from hacking away tree branches and decided to stop for a break and try to get our bearings. That's when we noticed something else that was wrong. It was completely silent, save for our labored breathing. These woods, normally teeming with life, were absolutely still. To this day, I haven't experienced anything like it. We couldn't hear a single bug or a bird or even the rushing water of the creek. It was suddenly dead. These comfortable woods that were so familiar to us suddenly felt alien and hostile. And we still had that feeling of being watched, although stalked might be a better word for it. Jacob and I were absolutely done with the adventure by this point. We were completely turned around and we couldn't even tell if we were heading back the way we'd come at this point. He tried to climb a tree to see where we were, but it was too difficult. He would have to break dozens of branches just to get a couple of feet off the ground. And these trees were tall. The branches were so thick that they blocked out the sun at times. When climbing the tree failed, we both started yelling in hopes that someone might hear us. But the only reply we received was the oppressive silence of the woods. It was at this moment of desperation that we spotted something through the trees, probably about 20 or so yards away. Out of the corner of our eyes, we clearly saw an adult-sized figure, which quickly moved behind a tree once we spotted it. Jacob and I traded one brief and panicked look at each other and bolted in the opposite direction of the figure. We sprinted like human wrecking balls through the branches, no longer taking care to carve ourselves a nice safe path. Branches clawed and scraped at our legs, arms, and faces as our flight instinct kicked into overdrive. My lungs burned, but I didn't care. At one point, Jacob, who was wearing our backpack full of water and snacks, got snagged on a particularly large branch. I stopped to help untangle him as fast as I could, and we kept sprinting, not daring to look back behind us. A few times, I thought I heard something breaking branches as it followed us, but I can't be certain. We continued running for what felt like ages. In reality, we ran for what was probably 15 to 20 minutes. When we finally broke through the tree line and into a clearing, I was so relieved I could have cried. I wish that the story ended here so that I could chalk it up to the overactive imagination of two stupid lost kids. But I can't. Because it turns out this clearing was essentially the backyard of a very large and very old two-story house. A house that we didn't know existed until that moment. Decades old blue paint peeled off the exterior. The roof was missing several shingles many of which were lying in the overgrown grass below. The house had several large windows that were caked with grime. A single dirt road made its way from the front of the house and up a small hill, and we couldn't see where it led. It was obvious that this house wasn't part of our neighborhood, or any neighborhood that we had been to before, for that matter. Jacob and I were halfway terrified and halfway in awe at our discovery. 
This house felt like our own personal discovery after a perilous quest. A bit of our fear from the woods evaporated as we summoned the courage to investigate. We walked up to the side of the house that was on our left and peered through the dirty window into the strange home. The first floor seemed to consist of mainly one large room. Along the wall opposite us was a wooden staircase leading to the second floor. The first floor was completely devoid of any furniture. No tables, no chairs, no couches or anything. Just dozens upon dozens of broken bottles. Shards of glass covered almost the entirety of the first floor, as well as a few yellowed books and magazines that were sprawled open, some with pages clearly ripped out and laying next to them. In the center of the room was a single sleeping bag, filthy from what we could see, with an unlit candlestick standing next to it. What are y'all doing? I nearly shat myself in horror. We immediately pulled away from the window and saw that a man had walked around from the right side of the building and was now standing about 15 feet away from us. He was wearing nothing except for some dirty denim overalls. He had scarred skin that looked like rough leather. And his eyes, well, neither of his eyes were looking in the same direction, and neither one was looking directly at us. Everything about this man looked wrong, and not just because of his physical appearance. You know how some people, you can just feel their energy? It's hard to describe, but this guy just felt so wrong in every way. We were frozen in place, surprised and terrified by his appearance there. We stared at him for a moment until Jacob found words to speak. We're, uh, 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 just checking out the house, he said sheepishly. The stranger seemed to take a moment to digest his response before gesturing to the woods and saying, you should head back the way you came. You never know. And he just let that last sentence hang in the air. You never know. Jacob, God bless him, quickly thought of something to say while I still stared in absolute terror. Well, actually, we need to head to the road. Our parents will be expecting us soon. The man did not reply. He just stood there with his mouth slightly open, his eyes dancing off in different directions. It seemed like he was thinking hard about something. We didn't waste another second getting out of there. We walked as quickly as we could toward the front of the house and made our way up the dirt driveway, for lack of a better term, trying not to appear panicked. I say driveway because there were no cars at the house, not even a garage. The front of the house consisted of a porch, which was also littered with old cans, broken bottles, and yellowed pages from old magazines. We felt the man's gaze boring into our backs as we trudged up the driveway. It was rather long, and once we rounded the first corner and were out of sight of the house, we started running again. Eventually, we reached a paved road. There was no mailbox or address that we could see. We followed this paved road for quite some time. It felt like ages before we could begin to recognize where we were again. It turns out that we had gone through the entire nature preserve and were on the complete opposite side from where our neighborhood was. It took the rest of the afternoon to walk back home, but we made it safe and sound without incident. We didn't tell our parents what had happened because we were afraid that they would restrict our freedom and not let us go into the woods again. And we didn't go into the woods again for a few weeks. When we did go back, we rarely left the trails, and we never went into that area again. To this day, Jacob is convinced that something paranormal is going on there, that we found ourselves in the midst of things both unfathomable and dangerous. We're both usually pretty realistic and grounded people, but I'm inclined to agree with him. I'm still not sure if the feelings of dread or spookiness in the woods 
and the house and the man are related in any way, I doubt I'll ever know. These events occurred two summers ago in the Grand Teton area. My boyfriend at the time, now husband, let's call him Harry, was an avid outdoorsman and also served in the military. I was an ecology major and wanted to spend more time outdoors. So he decided to take me on my first backpacking trip, just the two of us. For those who aren't familiar, the Grand Tetons are well known for their wildlife specifically grizzly bears. My only experience with bears up to this point was watching a little black bear cross the road from the safety of my car. Seeing grizzly country signs around every corner wasn't doing much to calm my nerves. The first incident. My boyfriend looked like Indiana Jones, machete hanging from his belt large knives attached to each side of his pack, bear spray strapped to his waist. You get the picture. The beginning of our 25 mile journey was all uphill. When in bear country, you're supposed to make noise so as to not startle the wildlife by accidentally sneaking up on it. As you can imagine, going up a steep hill while carrying a 40 pound pack makes it a little difficult to make conversation. We were an hour in and almost at the top of the ascent. I noticed that the woods had gone completely silent, save for the rushing stream that was to our left of the trail. Silent woods are never a good sign. This usually indicates that predators are nearby. At this point, I was in front of my boyfriend and we were about to crest the hill. For the past 20 minutes, we hadn't said a word to each other, having been too tired to speak. We noticed the silence at the same time and gave each other knowing glances. I came up over the top of the hill and immediately froze. Sitting not 10 feet in front of me in the middle of the trail was a grizzly bear. My husband wasn't aware yet, as he was behind me, so I did the first thing I could think of. While still in my frozen stance, I managed to take my arm and start flinging it wildly behind me, trying to get Harry's attention. I was too terrified to speak. The bear went from sitting to all fours, not looking away from us once. Harry quickly swung me around so that I was behind him, and he just started yelling. Being in the military, he knows how to yell. The grizzly wasn't quite phased as it started to walk slowly toward us. At this point, I was on the verge of passing out from terror. This bear was about five feet in front of us when we heard a loud crack coming from the woods to our right. The bear heard it too, and he bolted toward the stream. A second crack boomed again, this time much closer than before. My boyfriend said, it's probably just some falling branches, but we both knew that wasn't the case. At this point, we were walking quickly up the trail in an attempt to create some distance from the grizzly and those strange noises. I felt the hairs on the back of my neck stand straight up, and at the same moment, my boyfriend stopped moving in front of me. He turned around to look at me, and I turned around to look behind me. To this day, we're not sure what we saw. Back where we had been standing was a large black-brown mass. It looked to be three times bigger than the already large grizzly that we had seen just a few moments before. Its back was facing us, and then it stood on its hind legs. It looked similar to a bear, but something about the shape was just off. 
At this point, it was probably stupid to run away, but that is exactly what we did. We were aware of heavy footsteps behind us, but neither of us looked back. The footsteps eventually faded. At this point, I was a mess. My boyfriend was doing his best to console me. Honey, this is extremely unusual. The bears usually stay away from humans. We're going to be okay. I'm sure that won't happen again. That was enough to convince me to continue on the backpack. Not another hour later though, we reached a clearing where we decided to take a rest and have a snack. About a minute after we had sat down, I noticed bushes moving in a line toward the clearing, toward us. Out of the brush comes this adolescent grizzly who looks just as spooked as I'm sure we did, but he came straight for us. My husband, being the crazy nut that he is, decided to charge back at the bear while screaming, bear spray at the ready. That did the trick and the bear ran off. All I could think was just my luck, but that wasn't even close to what happened the second night. Night two. Before we began our backpack, we had to let the ranger station know which trails and route we planned to take. With this information, they usually send a ranger on horseback at some point during the backpack to check on you, just to make sure everything is okay. There weren't many approved trails left for us to choose from, and it was just our luck that they were the most difficult. Apparently, over the three days that we were on those trails, we had been the sole hikers. We didn't see a single other person once we were en route. However, I guess we missed the ranger who came to check on us. We had been following hoof prints the entire second day, and we hadn't seen any the day before. I had some foot problems, so we spent valuable daylight trying to adjust my boots, laces, and socks to compensate for the pain. When we started on the trail again, we had maybe an hour or two of daylight left, and in the woods, it gets dark fast. I was exhausted. It was now dark out, and Harry was the only one with a working headlamp, as mine wouldn't even turn on for some reason. We needed to find somewhere to set up camp, as we still needed to eat. It was freezing, and the wind was blowing. It was creating a howling sound as it rushed through the trees, which made it difficult to hear Harry or discern any other sounds coming from the woods. After another hour of hiking through the dark, we found a clearing. Well, it was more like a bowl. It looked to be about 200 meters in diameter, with the sides being about 10 meters down from the trail to the bottom of the clearing. This place was strange. We both felt it, though he didn't tell me how freaked he was until after we had left. There was no moonlight, so all we had was the illumination from his headlamp, our small camp stove, and the flashlight that I had fished from my pack. Half of the trees were dead or fallen, but just in the bowl. The vegetation everywhere else was very dense. To help alleviate my anxiousness, he started playing some music out of his portable speaker. This didn't help much, as it just echoed off the trees, creating a dissonance of sounds. He also thought that it would ward off any predators nearby. This is when we knew our anxiety was not paranoia. The silence was back. There hadn't been a single bird chirp since we arrived at the clearing. It also may have had to do with the obnoxious music, but because of our previous experience, we decided to turn off the music and head into the tent. Aside from everything else, it was freezing. As soon as we were situated in our sleeping bags, we heard deep cracks and thuds echoing from beyond the tree line. Falling trees? There had been a lot of wildfires and very little rain this season. 
thud. We both froze. That sound wasn't an echo. It came from inside the clearing, and it was definitely not a falling tree. Thud. It came from right outside our tent. We both stopped breathing. Harry's hand found mine, and we clung to each other, paralyzed. Something dragged across the outside of our tent, making an indent as it went along. It was thin, almost like a finger. What is it? I whispered, shaking. I don't know. It shouldn't be a person. We're the only ones on this side of the mountain. I was trying my hardest to stifle sobs, trying to listen to what was outside. I could hear steps, but I couldn't decipher what it was. The steps stopped, and then the whole side of the tent was slowly pushed inward. At this point, whatever was outside knew we were inside, so I shined my flashlight at the side of the tent. What I saw made my blood run cold. Pressed into the tent wall was the shape of a human face. I could make out the nose and open mouth. Each time they breathed, it made the tent around their mouth billow in and out. Harry said, F that, and pulled a Glock from his sleeping bag. He cocked it and the sound shattered the silence. The face pulled back and we heard fast footsteps heading toward the edge of the clearing. We didn't leave the tent till the sun was shining the next morning. The first thing we noticed was the smell of urine. We came out of the tent and looked around. Whoever it was had peed on our coals that we had left on the fire, leaving a disgusting stench of evaporated pee. Footprints surrounded our tent, circling around it multiple times. Muddy handprints decorated the outside of our tent. At least, we think it was mud. The takeaway? Wildlife is not the most dangerous thing in the backcountry. My wife, sister, and I are all avid backpackers. We spend a lot of time in the outdoors. But back in 2018, we decided to do pull-up camping with stargazing in Colorado as the main goal. We're from the Midwest. We used a light pollution map to find a remote camping area in San Juan National Forest and planned to hike during the day and stargaze at night. The first day and night, the stars and trails were amazing, and we were all super stoked to be in the mountains and away from Flatland. It was the clearest I've ever seen the Milky Way galaxy, and it was phenomenal. After the first night, we all got up early and decided to do another hike, this time following a small dirt forest road through the mountains. We were all having a great time, and there were nothing but positive vibes. I mentioned that our hike felt more like a walk since we were on a road, so we all agreed to take the first proper trail we came across. We had a GPS unit, a map, and a compass, so we weren't worried about getting lost. We finally came across a trail that ran perpendicular to the road and had a slight gradient running down the mountain. Staying true to our word, we all agreed to see where it went and turned onto the trail. As soon as we left the road and stepped onto the trail, I had an unprovoked and overwhelming feeling of doom come over me. Suddenly, my excitement left me and I felt, almost instinctually, that I would be in serious danger if I went down this trail. This unprovoked feeling of doom was strange enough, but when my sister said, guys, I don't think we should go down this trail, and my wife responded, oh good, you feel that too? I lost my shit. We quickly returned to the road and continued our walk. 
We all agreed that we had the same unprovoked sensation once we stepped onto the trail and could not come up with any logical explanation. I have never experienced anything like this, and it still gives me goosebumps just thinking about it. My story is nothing special, but I feel like I should write it down and tell it. It was during the summer of 2017 when my family had gone on vacation to California. We were at the end of our trip in which we'd been driving from San Francisco to Los Angeles to catch our plane back home. We had just finished seeing John Steinbeck's family home in Salinas earlier, and we were heading back to Los Angeles. I remember us passing the golden valleys where several wineries dotted the landscape. The sun was beginning to descend, as it was some time in the mid-afternoon, possibly around four or five. We were all packed into a rental van, with most of my family members being asleep save for my dad, who was driving, my grandmother, who sat in the front with him, and myself, who was sitting in the right side of the back. As we were coming around a bend in the road, our backs to the wineries, I suddenly heard my dad say, what is that? Being in the back, I could only peek at his side of the van, but I definitely could make out a dark figure crossing from the left side of the road. Reasoning that I would see it in just a few seconds, I quickly darted to my side, where surely I would see whatever or whoever it was come into view. As we got closer, I saw the figure suddenly change posture from upright to walking on all fours before disappearing behind the hill we were coming around. I attempted to see if I could see it behind the hill, but to my surprise, there was nothing there. There was nowhere for it to hide, considering it was man-sized, so I was dumbfounded. My dad and I were both confused. As he was paying attention to the road, he had only seen it upright. My grandmother was more than likely zoned out, as despite being in the front, she failed to see anything. Both my dad and I believe in the paranormal, and while he believed it was a Sasquatch, I believe it could have been a skinwalker or something similar. So far, it's the only instance of the paranormal I've come across in my life, but I still think about what that might have been to this day. I just got home from a road trip, and I've been thinking about something I saw and can't make sense of. Maybe some of you have also seen something like this. My wife and I were driving on Highway 97 South, near Mount Shasta, California. It was about midnight, and we were driving through a heavily wooded area without any street lamps. We rounded a corner when I saw something fast and low to the ground dart across the street, about 50 to 60 yards ahead of us. I saw the glowing animal eyes, and a body that was the size and shape of a big dog. We saw animals the whole road trip, and like usual, I asked my wife if she had seen it too, and she confirmed. The body wasn't 100% clear because of our headlights, they hadn't reached that section of the road yet. When we got to the exact point in the road where the animal had crossed, we looked to that side to see if there was anything there. All there was was a man dressed in army fatigues walking down the road. He didn't look at us. He just kept walking. It was pitch black and he didn't have any type of light with him. He was only illuminated by our headlights. We both got full body chills when we saw him because we were expecting to see an animal. I know that area has a magical and mystical history with a lot of unexplained sightings, 
but this is unlike anything I've ever experienced before. We were fully creeped out. I still can't make heads or tails of this, so I figured I'd tell you the story. Does anyone else have a story like this that happened to them? This happened a few months ago, and I've kept it to myself until recently when I told my dad about it. I was with my brother, who we'll call John, and one of our old friends. We were walking back through a forest back to where we'd come from. Since I'm younger than both of them, they tend to annoy me a lot, but this time they were being really annoying, so I decided to walk ahead. I was about halfway between them and the exit to the forest, when I heard things snapping on my left. I just brushed it off and kept walking, but then I started to hear a low mumbling noise, so I stopped and looked around. I asked if anyone was there, and I got no reply until about 30 to 40 seconds later. I heard what sounded like my brother, saying, Come here, I need your help. So I asked what was wrong while keeping my distance, because something about his voice sounded wrong. It was distorted. So I waited a few seconds, and then he said again, Come here, I need your help. But in the exact same way as before. So I moved to the side, and that's when I see it. It was a deer, but it was on its back legs and its body was rigid and twisted. The worst part was that its eyes were exactly the same as mine, like a human's. I didn't believe that it was a bad creature. It actually seemed quite friendly, but nonetheless I was scared. So I ran a mile back, and the whole time I could feel it behind me. When I got out of the forest, I fell to my knees and looked back to see it disappear behind some trees. But here's the weird thing. Ever since then, I've been having bad dreams. Not about being chased by it or anything. In the dreams, I am it. So I told my dad about this, and he didn't look surprised or confused at all. He told me of a similar event he had when he was young. To this day, I remember how it felt. That was the first time that I saw it, but I doubt it will be the last. I guess this story is a little boring, but it just happened to me, so here you go. I was rock climbing with two other guys in Colorado and was belaying one of them when the two of us on the ground heard something weird. The commands we use to communicate that we are safe at the top of a route are, name the guy on the ground, off belay, which prompts the belayer to unclip the rope from his belay device so the climber can pull slack out of the rope. The response to that command is, name of the guy at the top of the route, belay off. The climber was approximately 40 meters up on an about 50 meter route. I didn't know this at the time. The rope stopped moving, which isn't uncommon when someone is having a hard time with a move or is setting up an anchor, which is what we thought was going on. But then we heard it. A voice that sounded way closer to the ground, like close enough that we could have had a shouting conversation and way farther left off route of where the climber should have been, said, my name, off belay. I looked at the other guy in our climbing party who was just as confused as I was. He said to me, what the F was that? And we discussed where the climber should be at this time and that we shouldn't be able to hear him that well. The rope still wasn't moving, but I decided to keep him on belay. I figured it would be best to keep him safe and just feed slack through my belay device in the event that it wasn't him. Turns out it wasn't. 
A few moments later, the rope starts moving again. Later, followed by a faint syllable counted, my name off belay, that sounded way more like it should have. We didn't really think anything of it, but we had been traveling down the wall and hit a few routes without seeing anyone. We also had a friend just a few months ago that got burned in on a route when someone took him off belay when he wasn't safe. I remember seeing a video of a hiker or rancher or something walking down the road when he hears the voice of a woman calling him off the road. The guy stops to figure out what's going on, then just gets out of there because of how weird it was. I'm starting to wonder if there's a cryptid that can mimic the voice of a certain person. We're not entirely sure what happened, but we know two things. Number one, it's a really good idea that I didn't listen to that first voice. And second, it wasn't a person. My grandmother on my mother's side has always been very superstitious, for lack of a better word. She's not necessarily religious, but she does believe in a lot of paranormal stuff. Her mother was full-blooded Navajo, and her father was Irish. Either way, she'd never been anywhere east of Montana, and she grew up in Nevada. One year, when I was in grade school, we went to visit her. Most of the visit was pretty uneventful, typical boring old people stuff. Except she always kept her curtains drawn shut and would always peek out the window. And whenever somebody would ask her what she was doing, she would simply reply, Yenoglushi is watching me. This went on for nearly the entire visit until a few days before we were due to leave. My grandma and my then baby brother, he's 19 now, we're in the front yard that evening planting flowers when all of a sudden my grandmother starts shouting get away from that creature it's not safe to my brother of course being in nevada we all assumed that my brother had found a scorpion or a rattlesnake so we all run outside to see my grandmother clutching my little brother and shaking in terror against the side of the house standing out in the yard was a large, black, Great Dane-sized dog. It was staring at my grandmother with an intensity that I have never seen before. It looked up at us, gave a little huff, and bounded off. I don't remember if it moved unusually fast or not, but I do remember that it had very deep yellow eyes. When my mother asked my grandmother what had happened, she kept repeating, the Yenald Lucius found me. She moved a couple of weeks after that. I think I had an experience with a skinwalker or its kin. I wonder how far their territory ranges I lived in Phoenix for a couple of years at the turn of the century. I had two friends who grew up in Globe, a guy and a girl. She wanted to do a spell to make it rain. We went to a place on the Salt River. I don't know what it was called, but it had a parking lot, a pavilion, a bathroom, and the river had concrete steps in it, like man-made rapids. The pavilion had a concrete dais in the middle of it, inlaid with a mosaic of a compass rose. We got there at about 9 p.m. or so, well after dark, only two cars in the parking lot, and they were dusty, no other people. While we were doing our spell, which was minimal, all three of us standing quietly, concentrating around a candle and incense, I heard a noise. It was men and women laughing in unison, then two voices speaking very quickly, but I couldn't understand the words. And then a canine howl. My hair stood on end. We all jerked our heads toward the parking lot and stood stock still for a minute. 
but we didn't see anything or hear anything else. So we went back to concentrating. I didn't think the voices were weird in the moment. I figured the people that owned the cars had come back. I did think the howl was odd coupled with the voices, but I was thinking, cool, I got to hear a coyote. So after we finished the spell, we started wondering where the people were. And as we started talking, we realized that of the three of us, the girl had heard the speaking voices, the guy had heard the laughing, but I was the only one who had heard both or the howl. When I told them what I'd heard, they both got really pale. Their whole demeanor changed to alarm. And they said, we have to get out of here right now. I said, okay, but I have to pee first. They were very upset by this, but the bathroom was right by us. I went, but they were banging on the door in total panic after I'd been in there 30 seconds. I thought they were being overly dramatic. So we made it to the car and they're acting like we're in a horror movie. We left without further incident. After we got on the road, I asked them why they were so upset. They said that there were things that lived out there that I didn't want to know about. Apparently people who live in Globe have to deal with this kind of thing a lot, based on more stories the guy told me about living there. He never mentioned the word skinwalker though. I read about them later and finally understood why they were so scared that night. It was winter of 2017, around December. I was camping with friends right outside of a Native American reservation near St. George, Utah. None of us are native, but we were trying very hard to be respectful of the land. We set up an A-frame and every night we packed in like sardines. I was on the outside and my buddy Seth was next to me. Coyotes are pretty common in this area of the country but they're pack animals who don't really engage with campers. So it's very common to hear them, but not as common to see them up close. However, every night that week, we saw this mangled old coyote, gray hair, blistering skin, probably on the edge of death. It walked with a limp in its front left paw, kind of like a dog that gets a pebble stuck in their paw. Anyway, we went to bed one night and I was still on edge. Around 3.15, I woke up with a sharp pain in my ear. It ended up being a beetle burrowing in my ear, but that's not important. Anyway, I hit the side of my head and I pressed my ear and I was freaking out because it was this really acute pain that I had never felt before. I thought I was having an aneurysm or something. Anyway, I woke Seth up to have him shine a light in my ear. As soon as he woke up, he freaked out. Like he was horrified. I was like, what is it? He reached above his head and gets a mirror and he holds it up to me so that I could see behind myself. To my horror, there's a scraggly old man with gray hair, a huge tumor on the side of his face, torn up clothes, walking with a cane and a limp. He doesn't seem to be at all cognizant of us. It was almost as though he was in a different dimension. He didn't have a gun or anything, so we just clutched our knives and kept our eyes on him for the rest of the night. At one point, he just wandered away. The next morning, the two other people with us said that they both had a dream that this kid, Chris, who wasn't with us, was tied to a tree upside down and a massive silver glowing elk slowly but surely gutted him alive with its horns. They said the four of us and a few other friends all sat nude around the tree, not drumming or chanting, but almost like we were sacrificing him. They both had exactly the same dream and were able to independently draw the same picture down to the order that we were all sitting in to the number of branches on the tree without consulting each other. We texted Chris when we left, 
and he said he'd been up all night, throwing up, completely inexplicably. I don't know if we saw a skinwalker or what, but that was the weirdest experience of my life. My hometown is small and remote, and we had a Native American reservation a few minutes outside of town. I was close to a lot of the people that lived there, mostly the teenagers and children, as they shared extracurricular activities through the school, so I grew pretty accustomed to their beliefs. Now, I moved pretty far away right before I started high school, but I visited somewhat frequently, as I still had family there. My grandmother owned a camp on a small lake. It was very quaint and nice to spend time there. However, as soon as it became dark out, things felt very different. On one side, we had neighbors for miles. On the other, it was dense woods. My cousins and I, one a year older and one a year younger, had always found those woods creepy. We visited now and then, but always became very uncomfortable and soon left. One night, I was traveling back home, down south with my cousins and my aunt. These were very remote lake roads, inhabited by very, very few. Dense woods bordered both sides, so, naturally, some nocturnal animals were out. But one that we saw was very different. It wasn't as big as I typically see these creatures described, but it wasn't small either. Maybe the size of a large coyote or a small wolf. And we don't live in wolf country, by the way. But it didn't look like either of those. It was crouched back on its hind legs, just kind of chilling out. As we drove past, it turned its head to look at us. It had a pretty blank face, almost like an owl's, but without the beak, and a bear's muzzle instead. Its body looked like a poor rendition of a human. Like if you asked someone to draw a person but they had never seen one before. Its legs bent the wrong way, like a horse almost. It had toes like an alpaca. Its arms were very long. And frankly, it was the most human thing about it. It had very patchy, wiry, matted fur. Now, I know it wasn't an animal with mange. I've seen many animals with mange. And yes, it's scary, but it was nothing like this thing. It didn't necessarily chase us, but it trotted behind us for a while. Everybody was freaking out, naturally. But I think deep down, I knew. Can I get any confirmation or information about what this might have been? And if so, are there any precautions I should take to keep this thing away? It happened years ago, but I'm still lost. When I was younger, around 18, I was visiting my aunt in Albuquerque. She lived at a little B&B &B that had a big field behind it at the time. The second night I was there, I couldn't sleep. Around midnight, this bizarre howl or scream or cry started up. It was really loud, even inside the house. Her cats seemed to be alerted as well. So I woke my aunt up. She said that she had never heard that in 10 years of living there. Bear in mind, she's an insomniac, so she's often up very late. When the sound kept going, she started toward the door to go see what it was. But I was like, I don't think so. So we stayed in. The sound continued until around sunrise. The owner of the B&B &B was out of town at the time. But when asked, she said that she had never heard a sound like that either. We asked some of her friends who said that they had heard that somebody was going around playing sounds on a loop, trying to lure people out of the house. That's really the only lead I have. 
I went out into the field the next day and I didn't see anything weird. Maybe it was just someone messing with people, trying to lure them out for some nefarious reason. Or maybe it was a cryptid. Either way, it was pretty creepy. This is an experience I had that I can't really explain. This occurred in the summer of 2010. My stepdad has an old hunting cabin out in Pennsylvania. It's like a 10 minute drive outside of Cook's Forest. It's a small place with a common area and kitchen and a single bedroom with two bunk beds and a queen size bed. My mom, stepdad and I stayed at the cabin for a weekend to get rid of all the trash that other family members had left there and to do any repairs. There are other cabins nearby, but this weekend there was nobody else at the cabins within a half mile. There were also no street lights or even cell service. This is quite literally off the beaten path in the middle of the forest. We came up Friday, worked all day Saturday and left on Sunday. Saturday evening after dinner and a bonfire, everything is pitch black outside. No bugs chirping, dead quiet, which is relatively normal. At least most of the time, it's pretty quiet at night. We decide to head in. My stepdad and I are inside reading while my mom steps out to have a smoke and check to make sure that the fire has burned down to a safe level. I'm mid-page down in my book, and I hear my mom yelp pretty loudly. Now, I'm used to hearing her make this yelp. She's done it when she has seen a snake or gets a bug in her hair, so I didn't really think much of it. She comes in limping, though, and she says, Someone threw a rock at me. Immediately, my stepdad grabs his gun and runs outside, hoping to catch whoever did it. I was in shock not sure of what to think. I'm sitting with my mom while my stepdad makes laps around the cabin. He fired a few warning shots at the backstop we have set up on the back of the property to scare off whoever was around. We never saw anybody run off or even make a noise. When we go up, we always make jokes about Bigfoot now. And to be clear, there were no cabins on the road near us that had people staying at them. So I have no idea who would have been lurking in the woods in a pitch black forest just to mess around with people. They would have had nowhere to go, nowhere to stay, no transportation. It just makes no sense. Did we run into Bigfoot? Maybe. But as of now, I don't know. This is a story that happened to me 18 years ago. When I was seven years old, I lived in a farmhouse in the middle of nowhere. Both of my parents worked in the mornings and the school year had just ended, so I was home alone. From the kitchen window, I saw something strange in the trees, a creature of sorts. Two things I know for sure. Number one, this wasn't a little kid's hallucination. And number two, I know exactly what it looked like. This creature was about the size of a smart car and sitting about 15 feet up in the tree. It had proportions similar to a gargoyle, both in shape and posture. You know, how gargoyles sit hunched over with their back legs wider and their front arms or legs close together or touching just without the wings. No skin was shown. The creature had short bear-like fur mixed with owl-like feathers. The head was massive, the shape of a bear head and possibly a large beak. The only features I'm not totally clear on are some of the features of the face, 
because I was so fixated on the eyes of this beast. They were huge, like the size of basketballs. And the odd thing was that they were blurry looking, like a dripping oil painting. It was early summer morning, early enough to still be cool out, but late enough to be clearly lit everywhere. I saw the creature out the kitchen window, ran onto the porch, got a better look at it, and I wasn't about to go and check it out just yet. I was still about 50 yards out. I went in to grab my father's binoculars. When I got back to the front porch, the creature was gone, nowhere to be seen. So me, being a brave seven-year-old boy, went out to inspect the area that I'd seen it in. Upon arrival, I saw nothing. No broken branches or markings or anything. The one thing I do remember about the area that was different was that it was dead silent in a forest that's normally bursting with noise. There was not a single thing to be heard. The forest where I used to live was super loud too, with all sorts of animals making sounds at all times of the day and night. But it was dead silent. Super weird. I've never heard of any sort of cryptid that matches what I saw that day, and for 18 years I've been insanely curious. I'm not sure if anybody has anything that could lead me in the right direction, but if you do, I'd be grateful. So I'll never forget this for as long as I live. It was around December 2004, maybe early 2005, near Burlington, Connecticut. My friend and I were driving around ghost hunting, aka checking out cemeteries and the Green Lady Cemetery at night, because we were edgy goth kids. Plus, it was a full moon, so why not? Anyway, we got turned around on some of those back roads and ended up in this weird wooded area. It was winter. There was a little bit of snow on the ground, but not much. Maybe a couple of inches or so. We're driving down this really crappy paved road with lots of potholes in our old Honda, going relatively slow. All of a sudden, a deer crosses the road in front of us. My friend, who was driving, brakes. We were only going about 25 to 30 miles per hour. The deer, no joke, stared past our headlights and right at us. And this deer was huge. I don't know how the heck you measure a deer, but I know horses, and I would say that he was about 15 hands at his withers. His antlers were pretty average, nothing too dramatic, but he almost glowed in our headlights. It might have been the moon at that point, but it was still seriously creepy. He stared at us for a solid minute before my friend turned off the headlights. The deer then walked straight at the car, which caused both of us to panic, turn the headlights on and actually drive around the deer, which was still coming at the car. We drive away, now going much faster than 25 to 30 miles an hour, potholes and suspension on the car be damned. I happened to look out the window and no kidding, this deer is pacing us in the woods alongside us. It kept turning its head to look at us. We must have been going at least 40 to 50 miles per hour. We panic, but because of road conditions, we really can't go much faster without crashing or really screwing up the car. Finally, two miles or so down the road, we come up on a brightly lit patch of road with a school and a decent enough intersection that required a stoplight. I see the deer peel off behind our car and run back down the middle of the road. I still don't have any solid theories on what this could have been, but maybe I'm just trying to avoid admitting what I know it was. I 
I really hesitate to call this a skinwalker encounter, but I call it that because I really can't think of another creature that fits the description. So, here we go. A while ago, when I was in early high school, I was left alone at home for some reason. I can't remember the reason, but I was left home alone quite a lot after reaching my teenage years. So a little info on my house is that, although I don't live in a rural area, I certainly wouldn't call the area civilized. There are barns within walking distance of my house. I guess the area is developing because there are also subdivisions around. Also, my house has a sliding glass door that leads to a deck in the back. So I was home alone when I heard a knock at the door. It's common for my parents to sometimes leave the house without their house keys, so sometimes I would have to let them in when they got back. My family has a special knock that we use, so whoever's inside knows that it's one of us. This knock didn't sound like one of my family, so I just ignored it because I didn't want to deal with some stranger at the door. Whoever it was knocked again in a more familiar pattern, so reluctantly, I went to the door. When I got there, I didn't notice anyone out front. I figured that whoever it was just left because I took my sweet time getting to the door. Then I guess I heard a sound or something coming from the back sliding glass door. Another thing members of my family do is that if nobody answers the door, they'll try to find another way in, such as the back door. So I went to the back door and didn't notice anyone out there either. I slightly opened the sliding door and I heard a voice. It sounded like my mother, but it was coming from underneath the deck. The only reason I say that is because I definitely heard that voice, but my mother wasn't in view of me. Under the deck is the only place she could have been. I can't remember exactly what the voice said, but it was something like, open the door, and it said my name. Now I'm a super paranoid guy, and I know that my mom wouldn't be hiding if she wanted to come inside. So I shut the door, pulled the blinds over, and went to my room. Hours later, and my mom actually shows up, and I tell her what happened. She confirmed that she was not at the house earlier and did not try to get me to open the door. So for years, I didn't really know what to make of this experience. It was a very minor thing, but it spooked the heck out of me. I say it was probably a skinwalker because I don't know any other paranormal entities that would mimic a person's voice to try to lure you outside your house. But what do you think? I'm not exactly sure what this was, but I saw something strange in the woods outside of Homer, Nebraska. There's an old graveyard out here that's infamous for having a witch buried there, and it's kind of a local spot for kids to go and scare themselves. Most of the land out there is flat and used for farming, but this graveyard sits on the edge of a big hill and is surrounded by thick woods all around. Anyway, one night at around midnight, five of my friends and I decided to go out there in the woods and find the grave because the one in the actual graveyard is fake, and supposedly the real one is out in the forest. So we begin our adventure trekking through the dark night forest. I was in the back because I'm the biggest and strongest. It doesn't take us long to find the real grave, as a couple of the people I was with have been there before. We stick around for a couple of minutes, just messing around and trying to scare each other, when we all just get this instinctual feeling of dread. I know a lot of stories talk about this, but it's a very real feeling. Like your body is responding to danger before you can even realize what's going on. It's probably worth mentioning that as a kid, I lived in a haunted house, and I've been in situations where I've been attacked with a knife and jumped, and I've never felt this feeling before. We just decided to get away from that grave. Now this is where us being stupid teenagers almost got us killed. One of the kids I was with says that some people grow substances out here and that he knows where to find some. 
So even though we all clearly felt something was wrong, we decided, screw it, let's get high. As we started walking back through the woods again, I began to feel like we were being watched. And every now and then, I would hear rustling of leaves or just the crackling of undergrowth from behind me. I told my friends we needed to move faster, but they were all saying that I was trying to mess with them. Eventually, as we keep walking, we stumble upon a clearing and we can't really see anything ahead of us. All of a sudden, my friend starts taking off for the other end of the clearing and we all go after him. All around us, we can hear cattle freaking out. That might sound anticlimactic, but you try getting chased by a 1200 pound bull. So after we get a couple hundred yards away from the cows, something else scares them way worse than us. I mean, I have never heard a sound like that coming from an animal. It was a horrible mix of the cows being scared to death by something and like an unearthly ear shattering scream. We got the heck out of there in the opposite direction. Now, by this time, I realized we were lost in the middle of the woods at 2 a.m. with something stalking us. I finally convinced everyone that we should change our direction so we could get to the road. And about 30 minutes later, we're making progress as someone spots some headlights way out in front of us that we can see on top of the hill we're on. So we start walking down toward the road when I noticed that the sounds behind us had started back up again. I turn to my friend and I tell him to point his iPhone flashlight back behind us. I only saw something for a second, but about 30 yards behind us, I saw a blackish brown figure with yellow eyes lean its head out from behind a tree and then quickly duck back behind. This is what really freaked me out as animals around here don't sneak around and duck behind trees. I got the best look at it out of my friends and the head looked kind of like a gaunt German shepherd. There aren't any wolves or bears around here. As far as I know, there are no large predators at all. It was a little bit elevated, but it was still eye level with me. I'm 6'3", and this thing was at least six feet. At this point, I take off. I swear I've never run that fast in my life. We make it to the road in under five minutes, but we realized that we came out on the other side of the woods and we had to walk back the three miles down the road toward our cars. It was honestly the scariest night of my life. And to make things worse, I ended up losing my wallet out there that night. I've been back multiple times, but never at night now. Whatever it was, it was not a human or an animal. Based on other stories I've heard, I think it might have been a skinwalker or a dogman. But your guess is as good as mine. Sometime in the early 1980s, my family lived in Arizona, as my father was stationed at an army base near Sierra Vista, which is some 70 or so miles south of Tucson. My father, myself, our neighbor, and his three sons were going to lend a hand in the construction of the neighbor's friend's home in the desert, a little over the halfway point between Sierra Vista and Tucson. I'm not sure what a couple of teenagers and a couple of eight-year-old boys were supposed to do, but we were going to be camping in the desert over the weekend. So it was an adventure to me and quality time with my father. For the sake of anonymity and to make explanations easier, we'll call their father Jerry, the eldest brother James, the second oldest Mike, and the youngest Tommy. At any rate, we got to where the site was and we set up camp. Our dads and Jerry's buddies headed out to get some pizzas from the Benson, the closest town to us, close to a half hour away. It was about an hour before dusk and the four of us still at camp were just sitting around a campfire telling stories. The sun had now set and we were checking out the stars that were starting to come into view. Tommy and I hadn't really noticed anything, 
until James had told us to get in the tent as he got up and pulled a rifle out of Jerry's truck. Quickly looking around, we took notice of several pairs of eyes just beyond the reaches of the campfire's light. There was a pack of coyotes all around the camp. Tommy and I made a mad dash for the tent and hunkered down inside, peering out at these watchful eyes through little mesh windows. That's when I noticed something odd. One of these coyotes wasn't like the rest of them. Its eyes seemed to be farther up off the ground than those of the others. The eyes were a deeper yet brighter shade than that of the other coyotes. The campfire made them all appear as silhouettes against the desert backdrop, but this one was much larger. To make it even stranger, the group of coyotes on one side of the camp were pretty much evenly spaced apart, but the ones that I was looking at seemed to be farther away from the odd one. It was almost like they were intentionally keeping their distance from it. I'm not entirely sure what I was seeing, but I seemed to instinctively know that what I was looking at was not a coyote. Tommy and I were both scared, but we were scared for different reasons. I was so terrified, I was practically trying to get as low to the ground as I could while still keeping an eye on this odd coyote. If I could have gone past the bottom lining of the tent and buried myself in the sand, I would have. I heard the crack of the rifle as James sent around toward one of the groups. They scattered, but not the odd one. He stood his ground, didn't move an inch. James sent another round off toward the odd one. It flinched and stepped back a few feet. I don't know if he hit it or not. I just know that it scared the crap out of me and I wanted it to go away. Moments later, the headlights of my dad's van came into view and this odd coyote, along with the others, ran off. I didn't want to accept the explanation of just coyote, but I did, simply because I didn't know what it was, and I wanted to convince myself that I didn't see what I did. This was one of the few times that I have encountered something that terrified me. Some 30 years later and a whole lot of research, and I'm pretty sure I know what I saw. I just don't want to come out and say it. This incident occurred during the summer of 1983 as I was about to begin my senior year in high school. My family lived in rural Pennsylvania, in northern Indiana County. Our farmhouse was built in the mid-1800s. In the early 1900s, an addition was added to the back that more than doubled the size of the original house. The original house was a four-square house, so-called for the four square rooms, two on the first floor and two on the second floor, with a staircase in the back. The house as a whole was sturdy, albeit a bit cranky. Every night in summer, I fell asleep listening to the pops, cracks, creaking, and groans as the house cooled off in the night air. The house was built on high ground next to the mouth of an ancient ravine that ran for over a mile, deeper and darker and rockier as it went, down to the north branch of a little creek. The ravine was heavily wooded at the beginning then the trees got sparser to a few old ones tenaciously rooted into the eroded rocks and glacial till. It was dark and cool and damp down in there, even on the hottest summer day, and I spent many summer days down in those woods. I knew the plants, the trees, the birds, the deer. I heard much that I couldn't see, like the rabbits running through the brush and the squirrels high up scolding me as I walked. I could sense the ones that hid and made no noise, the bobcats lurking in the nocturnal critters and peeking at my back after I passed their burrows. Sometimes sudden waves of total silence would descend on the woods. The air would be still. The birds would silence themselves. I taught myself to stop at these moments and to observe. 
I knew it wasn't me that made the animals go silent, so I figured something, a bobcat perhaps, was close by. I never saw what it was that caused the silences, but I loved to imagine myself as a skilled tracker. Nothing of the sort, of course, but I will claim to know those woods. I also had a friend and companion that roamed the woods and ravines around with me, a big male German shepherd named Chap. Chap loved to run and roam and chase groundhogs. We prowled along through the woods for years. This particular night, I awoke suddenly, very awake and alert. The wind was blowing against the open window. Our room had the crank out windows that were popular in the 70s when the hose had been remodeled. The bottom of the window tilted out and the rain ran off. There was a low rumble off in the distance, the thunder of a summer storm blowing in from the west. I was laying on my belly, my face on the left side on my pillow, and my arms around and under my pillow. I listened to the rain. It was not unusual for me to wake up in the middle of the night. It's been a regular occurrence in my life since I was very young. By that point, I was 17 years old. I was used to my 3 a.m. ritual, though still very irritated by it. Across the room, I could hear my brother breathing. I could hear our dog lying on the foot of my brother's bed, sniffing at the rainy night air blowing in the window. Across the hall from our room, I could hear my dad's low, steady, rumbling snore. Then I heard something that made my eyes fly open in the pitch black room. From down in the ravine, off in the distance, I heard an animal call unlike any I had ever heard. It was a roar, an angry roar. To the best of my knowledge, the apex predator in those woods was the bobcat, but this was too deep, too throaty for a bobcat. Then I heard it again, surprisingly closer, a lot closer. I listened for my brother's breathing. Silence. He was awake. What was that? I loudly whispered. I don't know. He whispered back. There was obvious concern in his voice. Then we heard it again. It had to be no more than 75 feet from the house. Down at the corner of the yard where the trail led into the woods and down into the ravine. First of all, it was no bobcat. It was not a dog. It was not a coyote, and it was most definitely not a man. Next to my bed was a softball bat. I still have it, as a matter of fact. That night, all I wanted in the world was to slide my hand out from under the pillow and reach down and grab that bat. But I couldn't move. Everyone in the house seemed paralyzed. I kept expecting to hear my dad throw his bedroom door open, but he never made a sound. Then, two things happened in rapid succession. There was a tremendous crash, like something or someone had run headlong into the house. Then there was another roaring, screaming howl, this time right next to the house. It was an angry, roaring shout, so loud that I felt like it was next to my face. I had never in all my life heard an animal make a noise that loud. It was like a V8 engine with straight pipes was running wide open throttle. At the same time, there was a throbbing, a low frequency growl that seemed to make the house vibrate. All I could do was close my eyes and try to scream, but nothing came out. I must have passed out. The next thing I know, it was morning. The sun was shining. The house was still there. I slept in, which was very unusual in my family. I went downstairs and my dad and brother had already left for the day. My mom stood at the sink, washing dishes. I looked at my mom wide-eyed. Surely she had heard what happened. She met my eyes and pointed to the back porch of our house, a small side room that housed the washing machine, dryer, and coat closet. I walked to the back porch to see that the door that led to the outside had been ripped from its hinges and lay flat on the floor of the porch. In the coat closet, with his nose pressed as far back as it could go, laying in a puddle of his own urine, was Chap. 
He lay there, whimpering for two days before he finally came out again. I was given the task to fix the door. When it was up and repaired, I went to my mom and basically asked, are we just gonna pretend that nothing happened last night? My mom sighed with obvious exasperation and said something along the lines of, well, what would you like to know? You know what that was, your dad knows, I know, we all know. Not much to talk about, other than how scary it was, and frankly, I don't need to talk about that, thank you. And for my family, that was pretty much the end of it. I brought it up once not long ago. My dad just shrugged and said, I know as much now as I did that night. Me? I drive there on occasion, when I'm in the area. I stop on the old country road and listen a while. I listen to the wind and the birds, and then I drive on. So the area that my grandparents lived in was somewhat known for Bigfoot sightings, and my grandfather had seen some signs of it too, a set of footprints in the snow that strode uninterrupted over a four-foot fence, calls from the forest, etc. They live at the edge of a state park in Ohio. I've seen plenty at this point, but back then I hadn't had any experience with the paranormal, at least as far as I knew. Bigfoot fascinated me because of all the cryptids it seemed the most plausible, and I'd spend some of my week there watching documentaries and discussing it with him. Now he wasn't much of a prankster, but it had happened enough that when something actually did happen, I just thought it was him. I had just gotten into bed at the end of their trailer. I was there for maybe 20 minutes, insomnia, when I heard this call outside the window, passing by quickly down the hill. Imagine an orangutan hoot, not a loud one, just that idle huffing that they kind of do to each other. Pitch that down a ways and then have it coming from lungs that should belong to a bear or a moose. As I said, my first thought was to rationalize that maybe it's grandpa messing with me. He almost had me too. This thought lasted until I remembered the way that the trailer sits on the hill. The bottom of these big windows is sitting six feet off the ground. The noise had definitely come from above me in bed, near the tops of the window. So whatever made that noise was two or three feet higher, and the old guy didn't own any stilts. I wish I'd gone to look, but the realization that something that massive had decided to make a noise right next to me just struck me with paralyzing fear. I was playing around an abandoned area within sight of the trailer later that same week, jumping around, rotting beams, and poking through whatever was left, when I just stopped. There was a massive, imminent presence behind me all of a sudden. No noise alerted me. I hadn't seen anything move. It was just pressure. Nothing inherently threatening in it, just the sheer weight of the gaze is what got me running. I have felt the presence of ghosts, at least one demon. What I'm pretty sure was eldritch shenanigans, and let me tell you, nothing has ever had the weight of that. The power. It felt more real and present than I think people can be. Anybody else have something like this happen? Not a sighting, but just a sense of something? An impossible noise or an encounter that was just too close? Let me know. Here are several odd encounters that I've had. Please tell me what you think they are, or were, and your thoughts on them. All of these occurrences have happened near the Blue Ridge Mountains of Virginia. Not near Navajo land, of course, but I was hoping that I could be pointed toward the right information as to whether or not I encountered a skinwalker, or if there's some kind of Eastern cryptid that is similar. Number one. As a child, 
I used to be really interested in the supernatural. I constantly read about werewolves and vampires, but not about other cryptids, such as skinwalkers and wendigos, until recently. I grew up on a farm surrounded by woods, and the first encounter I had with something unsettling would have been during a sleepover I had with two friends. After a riveting day running through the woods and having fun, we settled down for bed. It was a full moon, and the light pierced through the blinds that I had. My two friends were sleeping on the bottom bunk, while I slept on the top. They had fallen asleep, but I seemed not to be able to sleep, so I decided to peek through the blinds. The full moon stared at me, and I looked away for a second, but when I looked back, there was a creature. The head was shaped similar to that of a horse, with glowing red eyes and shaggy, thick, dark brown hair. It was about two feet lower down than I was, right outside my window, eye level with me. The window was about six feet off the ground. The bunk bed was also about six foot. So this creature must have been about nine feet tall. I don't know what it was, but it certainly scared me, badly. Number two. My best friend C and my other best friend at the time K and I were all having a sleepover together outside in a tent. In our tent, we had one light, a small battery operated lantern. It was dark and quiet outside when all of a sudden a stick was hurled at our tent. My friend C felt that we were in danger, but didn't know from what. C had just moved from Arizona near the Navajo reservation and had recently experienced a skinwalker herself. We had no way to defend ourselves, so we decided to attempt to grab something that could be used as a defense from our car near the tent. C decided to be the one to go and grab it. As she went toward the car, she screamed. She immediately sprinted back with fear in her eyes. We asked her what happened, and she told us about a large figure with glowing red eyes resembling a wolf. We ended up leaving that tent for good later on. Finally, number three. As an avid trail runner, I am used to the woods in which I run. I tend to run near dusk as the sun is setting, but I refuse to run when it's dark. I feel at home in the forest. I've never feared it, not until now. Only recently did I experience three odd phenomena. I began to feel like I was being watched while I ran. Yes, I know, the forest is always watching, with all of its animals watching what I'm doing, but this feeling is different. It's more of a fear-inducing feeling. Then about four days after this began, I saw these glowing orbs. Only a couple, but they led deeper and deeper into the woods. All of this led toward a place my father and I found when I was young, where a deer's rib cage was stuck in the hollow of a tree, almost as if it was put there purposely. There's also a big mound of rocks near it. Those rocks were not just randomly placed. They were formed, like a large rectangular shape similar to a grave. I haven't seen the orbs since, but it was unsettling. By far the most unsettling thing that has ever happened there would be the amount of times that I've felt something was following me or chasing me in the woods. I've even had this gut feeling that something was trying to lure me deeper into the woods. Whenever I feel that something is so off and that there are malicious intentions, I turn around and go back. The feeling of dread has only gotten stronger and I'm at a loss for what might be causing it. There's this forest near my house in the southeast of England that my friends and I use for mountain biking, but it's got this very uncomfortable, strange vibe to it. The only person we ever see here is the same older man walking his dog, but he always appears when we're feeling really uneasy due to the energy. He'll suddenly just walk past and you never see him coming. 
there's a tree that has become a memorial for a dog that died, coincidentally a German Shepherd, the same breed as the man has and looks very similar too. Sometimes in the farthest corners of the woods, I distinctly hear a dog collar behind me or nearby. Here's where things get a bit strange. There's a spot we use for campfires and drinking. We were there late at night, around 9 to 10 p.m., but gradually began feeling creeped out as the energy started to increase. We started hearing a very strange noise. It was definitely not a fox or a bird. It sounded very sweet and innocent at first, until it turned into a blood-curdling shrieking. We quickly packed our stuff and went on a mission to get the hell out of Dodge. There's a field that serves as the main access point to the woods. We were using the main path through it and got an overwhelming sense of dread, sadness, and almost anger all mixed together. In the bushes to the side of the path, we heard running, very heavy running. And all of a sudden, we started hearing the most horrible growling and screaming noises, getting worse and worse until we got to the exit of the field and it all stopped. We didn't hear it run away, but all the noises and running just stopped. We all had strange dreams that night. One time, I heard very heavy running footsteps in the bushes right behind me while my friend was having a pee. I turned around to see if it was him, but there's no way it was because he hadn't moved from his spot. He came back and asked if I had heard the running too. Two days ago, I went back there for the first time in around five months alone as I moved away from the local area. The strange feeling was still there and in some areas felt like it had gotten worse, but I didn't let it bother me. I went back again today and there was heavy rainfall the last couple of days, so the ground is very muddy. I kept hearing the dog collar that follows me around and I noticed strange hoof marks in the ground, but they were very inconsistent. Groups of them would appear and then there wouldn't be any more until 15 to 20 meters up the path. They definitely weren't there two days ago and these woods take so long to get into, many people wouldn't bother going there and it's impossible to get a horse in there. I have a few theories about this forest. One, I think it could be a similar presence to Goatman as he was often linked to canine deaths. The potential cryptid activity and hoof marks are consistent with this theory. Two, very unlikely but plausible, it could be the devil's hoof marks. The presence feels very demonic. Third, the forest is potentially a dumping ground for bodies. There was a suspected murder in the local town and police searched the woods. It would explain the strange presence, but not the cryptid activity. Or four, people with dirt bikes sometimes use the forest. Maybe one of them could have died there and haunts us. People have told me that it's just a deer, but that is impossible. We don't get them around these parts at all. I've literally never seen one. I just have no idea what it is that we witnessed. Back about 10 or so years ago, my good friend and I would occasionally take trips to her family's property out in the middle of nowhere. It was fairly remote. You had to drive up a dirt road a few miles and couldn't access it unless you had a key to the chain on the gate. There wasn't anyone around for miles. All that was there was a trailer that they had towed up and left to sleep in. The feel out there was always a little off. One day, we were wandering around the property. We didn't think much of anything until about 20 minutes later, when we realized we had actually been walking out into the middle of nowhere. We had no water with us and had no clue where we were. Luckily, we found our way back after a while, but neither of us could explain why we did that. I'd also take my voice recorder and we caught quite a few strange things on that. 
One day before heading out there, we were talking about Skinwalker Ranch. It was only about a 40 minute drive from the property. So we thought, hey, why don't we go and try to find it? We thought it would be cool to say we had been there. After searching the internet, we found fairly good directions there and headed out for the night. We had a bit of trouble locating it, but after a bit of driving around, we pulled up into an area that was spot on from the descriptions we had read. We stepped out of the car, and the first thing we noticed was the massive amount of bugs swarming around us. Only a few short seconds later, we heard huge dogs barking, growling, and then saw them running at us. We immediately jumped back in the car and took off. We ended up staying in the general area for a little while longer, just exploring. Later that night, back at her property, we were sitting around the fire talking. All of a sudden, we start hearing barking. It was rather startling, and she immediately froze and said that she had never heard barking in the area before. She isn't one to get scared easily, so her uneasiness put me on edge. Not too long after that, there was more barking. Very slowly, we were being surrounded by what I assumed were coyotes. We both tried yelling, jumping around, throwing rocks, but it didn't seem to do any good. I had never known coyotes to act this way. We were terrified and had no clue what to do. Not really wanting to stick around and find out if they would get any closer, we doused the fire and flipped on our flashlights. She grabbed my hand, and we booked it into the trailer. We were both shaking by the time we made it in, and she locked the door. I don't think either of us slept that well. I heard a lot of weird sounds and felt a sense of dread the entire night. As soon as the sun started to rise, we decided to pack up and get out of there. We neared the car, and what we saw sent chills down my spine. On the driver's side of the car window was a huge handprint made with mud. It was easily twice the size of our hands. We looked at each other and silently agreed that we needed to get the hell out of there. I'm not saying it was a skinwalker, but neither of us have ever been able to explain it, and I have never been back. My mom, my mom grew up near northern Wisconsin, and she told me some stories a while back which happened to her, her brothers, and others in their area, and I feel that some of them are worth mentioning. I've had my own paranormal experiences, which I feel are quite difficult to talk about, and I've talked about a few of them on Reddit. But for now, I want to tell you another one of my mom's stories. One of the stories my mom told me was something that had happened to a family that had apparently lived nearby them. There was a family driving through the forests and eventually their car broke down. This would have been in the 70s or 80s before cell phones were widespread. So they ended up getting out of their vehicle and making the journey home on foot. Eventually, however, they started to notice sounds from behind them as if something was following them through the woods, or perhaps more aptly put, stalking them through the woods. When they ran, it ran. When they stopped, it stopped. Eventually, they were able to get to their house and they quickly entered, slammed the door and locked it. Whatever was following them let out a bellowing scream. Apparently, the family had alerted my grandfather as to what had happened and told him to look into his fields. According to my mom, he had apparently come back into the house wide-eyed and alarmed, but he didn't elaborate on what he saw. I vaguely recall my mom talking about him seeing some sort of glow in the field though. I'm unsure if it's related, but my oldest uncle went horseback riding with a friend and they apparently came across this thing. Apparently, it was white and furry and when it saw my uncle Mike and his friend, 
It stood up on its hind legs, bounded over a fence, and ran off. Apparently, it left behind some fur, which my uncle apparently collected. But this would have been many, many years ago, and my uncle died when I was about four years old in a bad accident, so I'm unable to ask him about the story. I'm unsure if both of these stories are related or not, and there could be some natural causes to these things. Black bears, wolves, dogs, etc. All would be living in the area. However, judging by the tone of the story, and the fact that such animals are rather commonplace and it was apparently during the day, I'm not sure if it would have been mistaken identity or not. What does interest me, though, are the stories of the Wendigo, Skinwalkers, and the Wisconsin-Michigan Dogman. Could it be related if it was not a case of mistaken identity? I don't know, and I don't really care to find out either. Just be careful in the woods. Mother Nature can be a cruel mistress, and there is darkness in the world. Be it supernatural, or the very, very real depths of human depravity and cruelty. Protect yourself and your loved ones. I've had a long history of paranormal things happening to me, but these take the cake. I lived in the middle of Hicktown swamps in Georgia when these took place. When I was 13, I ran away from home for personal reasons. I booked it to a local nature trail in the middle of a wildlife reserve. I ran down it about 15 minutes, and a hand reached out from the bush to my right and hit me in the chest. I got back up and looked for my attacker, but there was nothing there. I proceeded to run home, crying like a real man. When I was 15, I was laying in bed, scrolling through creepypasta articles, when I hear a sort of rhythmic tapping on my window. I freak out and pretend I can't hear it for a while, until I can't stand it anymore. I pull the curtain back. It's only a raccoon. I hit the window and scare him off and try to calm myself down. About a half an hour later, the same tapping, the same rhythmic pattern. Kinda like click, click, scratch, click, click, scratch. So I decide I'm gonna get my BB gun and take it out on the raccoon, scare him, you know, so he won't come back. So I grab my BB gun, I open the window, I take aim, and there's this shadowy figure that resembles a man staring right at me, right on the border of my lawn that connects my yard to the huge expanse of woods around my house. And it just stares at me and slowly walks into the woods behind it. After that, I didn't sleep for about a week. In fall of last year, on a walk down the nature trail with two of my friends, Antoine and Justin, we were just cracking jokes and drinking. It was 4 a.m. and we were just having a great time. On the walk back home, I feel this awful presence. I look behind me and I see something at the end of the trail in the distance. My vision isn't the best, but from what I could tell, it looked like a man with a deer head as his own. So I looked away. I told my friends not to say a word until we got home. Justin knew of my past occurrences and he doesn't really mess around with paranormal stuff, so he listened and just kept walking. But Antoine just looked at me for like 15 minutes while walking perfectly straight. I freaked out and started doing the strangest movements of my arms to see if he would mimic them, and every time he would. At one point, I locked both my arms and put them on my head, and he did the exact same thing. I was ready to just leave him in the woods that night, honestly. Eventually, he screamed something completely unintelligible, and it scared the crap out of me, so I threw a punch at him and he dodged it. I apologized, told him to shut up, and then told them all to run home with me. When we got there, we discussed what we had seen and what happened, and Antoine said that he completely blacked out as soon as we started walking the nature trail, only to wake up to me throwing a punch at him. 
About two months ago, another thing happened, and this was where I drew the line. I've moved since this incident, and I honestly don't plan on ever going back. I was walking down the nature trail again. Clearly, I hadn't learned my lesson. I was listening to music, having a good time, and this thick, permeable smell of blood hit my nose. I genuinely thought I had a nosebleed for a second, until, through my headphones, I hear somebody talking. I take off one of my headphones and have a look around. Nothing. Speed walking out of there, it happens again. And this time, it sounds exactly like a man screaming, Warbringer. Instantly, I'm on the verge of tears. I jerk back and look around as fast as possible. And I see it. There's a fully naked man, resembling more of a corpse than a man, with a bleeding, rotting horse's head. His arm was extended out toward me. I ran home and packed my things. Now by this point, I have so many theories as to what happened, but I hate indulging them. They all scare the hell out of me. My current idea is that I'm just nuts. I'm not sure, but whatever the case is, if there's anyone here who can explain what I saw, I'm very open to it. I've told a story before about living in a flat where this thing that I called the Whistler always came by. I had other experiences in this flat too, and this one thing has to be the worst by far. It's hard to describe the sense of dread and fear that this thing gave off. It honestly felt like my life was at risk, and my whole body would scream to run. Anytime I would hear this thing, I was alone, which, of course, just made it all worse. One night, the dog was barking outside, so I got up and went out to look. As I was looking outside, the dog went back in and left me alone, standing in the dark next to the shed. I soon became aware of noises in the shed, but put it down to the wind. That is, until I moved closer, and I felt a strong sense of dread. I listened to the sound. It sounds like a person on all fours scuffling around. I heard it move toward the shed door, so I ran inside and slammed the door. I sat down and tried to tell myself that it was still just the wind. At first, the dread was going away, but then I could feel it building up again. It felt like it was trying to find a way in, moving back and forth along the walls of the house. Then, I suddenly felt it inside the apartment. It had gotten into the kitchen. I'm not quite sure how. The window, maybe. I could feel it getting slowly closer. I was too scared to look behind me into the kitchen, but I managed to jump up and slam the door. I hoped it would leave, and it did. After this, I would hear it sometimes, just scuffling around at night. The alley at the back was dark and smelly, so I assumed it liked it. Now this next bit is truly a fault on my own part. I really should have listened to my own gut feeling. It was months later, it was summer and therefore very warm, so I had the back door open. I was on my laptop and it had gotten dark. At some point, I turned the light on and sat back down. I sat facing the back door. My laptop screen stopped me from seeing the bottom half of the door. After a while, I started to hear movement outside and felt uneasy, but I told myself that it was nothing. Yep. I just sat there and told myself I was being stupid. But the feeling grew stronger and stronger, my whole body screaming at me to run. Then our dog comes running downstairs, stops in the middle of the room, looks at me, and then goes to walk outside. The way she did this was just odd. I pulled down my screen and watched her head toward the back door. As she walked out the back door, there was this thing. 
Some humanoid figure crouched down by the door. Its skin was dark brown, like dirt and rot, and had texture like it'd been burned. It was hairless and skinny, like it hadn't eaten in months. There it was, this thing I had been in fear of for so long, right up against the door frame, trying to make its way inside. The figure twisted its emaciated form round to follow our dog. It was crouched down onto its hands and feet. That's why it was making the scuffling noise. I jumped up and threw my laptop to the floor. I ran upstairs and refused to go back down alone. The stupidest thing was that I doubted myself, and if it wasn't for the dog, then I don't know what would have happened. Her look toward me when she came downstairs. I can only imagine she was wondering why I wasn't running away. A friend told me it sounded like a skinwalker and that Europe does have accounts of such things, but I don't know. I don't know what that thing was, but either way, I'm so happy that we moved. I actually overheard this on the news a few years back, about a cryptid in Kentucky. It's a feline-like creature, said to look like a mountain lion mixed with some sort of monstrosity. I didn't really think much about it until my friend, we'll call him Bran, told me what he saw when he was deer hunting. It was pretty late and he and his dad were about to pack up. They heard a low growl near them. His dad told him to get back up in the hunting perch. I'm not a hunter by any means, so don't crucify me for not knowing the correct lingo. Bran did and watched through his binoculars to watch for what had made the growl or for his dad to give him an all good. He watched for what he said might have been 10 to 15 minutes when movement caught his eye. He tried to get a better look when he saw the weird creature that I mentioned earlier. It scared him so badly that he froze. He thought it was just a mountain lion or a bobcat, but it had four eyes. His dad managed to distract it off by startling a nearby doe. It left chasing its newfound prey. He and his dad waited until they couldn't hear it and then booked it back to their truck. He was pretty shaken up the whole week after. I felt bad for him. However, this wasn't his only run-in with a cryptid or a strange creature. Despite being underage, he still does a lot of dangerous or stupid things, such as drinking and driving, smoking cigarettes, and other really dumb things. He's not shy about it either. Well, he'd been doing that first one, but wasn't totally drunk yet, and his best friend, we'll call him Dave, was taking a joy ride with him on some back roads, which aren't hard to find in our region. They were messing around, having a good time, blaring music, you know, teenager things. He was focusing on the road, listening to a story Dave was telling him, when he saw a strange, pale, humanoid, quadrupedal, fleshy creature with visible teeth and large black eyes run out onto the road. Bran hit his brakes and just barely missed it. It screeched at him and ran off into the woods on the other side of the road. Bran and Dave sat there trying to process what had happened and if what they both saw was real. They stopped drinking and went straight back to Dave's house, where they proceeded to freak out. They told me this story, too, as I sat next to them in a couple of classes. While I asked them to describe the creature to me, as I'm known for researching and collecting information on cryptids, urban legends, and monsters, and they felt I could help. After they gave me the description, I came up with a list of possible creatures and showed them art and, quote, real pictures of them on Bran's phone. Once we got to Wendigo's, Skinwalkers, and the Rake, they showed clear signs of distress. I pulled up one of the well-known Rake pictures and showed it to them. I thought Bran was going to have a heart attack. He yelled, that's it. It has to be. It's almost dead on. Dave scrolled through the related pictures and found a different photo and quietly showed both of us. Bran then fell silent. They both said that that was it. That was the creature they nearly hit. 
I told them that they had to be bullshitting me, because the rake is a creepypasta. I told them the story and what it's known for, and that they were not proven to be real and were in fact very likely fake. But they insisted that that's what they saw. They thanked me and asked me if there was a way to protect themselves if it came for them. I told them I didn't know, but fire was probably the best route if it actually was real. They haven't had any experiences since that I know of, but it did freak them and me out a good amount. I was glad I could help them, but now I'm terrified of the woods, more than I previously was, and I question more and more if these legends are just legends. I already believed in a few, but it's just terrifying to think that more of them could be real. It was the summer of 2010, and I was still in high school. My friend's dad invited me with his family to go camping near a lake that was a Native American reservation at one point. We get to the campsite, and my friend and I start experiencing weird things. We got chased by a swarm of ghost bees, and we just started to feel like it wasn't safe to be by ourselves. There was a shaman who was going to tell stories around his campsite, and he was inviting campers to come by that night and listen. When night came, I had to walk a ways to the public restroom at the campsite. I get to the restroom, and a guy comes running out, screaming that there are hornets in the bathroom. I was scared of stinging bugs, so I decided to go in a bush that was about four yards away from the restroom. I start peeing and I start hearing rustling coming from the bush. I shine the flashlight and he has darkish skin with white face paint and he's almost half naked. I jumped back and I screamed and I scraped my elbow. A nearby camper ran over to help me and I told him that I saw a man crouched in the bushes. This dad-like figure shines his flashlight into the bush and dives into the bush. Now, all this happened in a matter of minutes. From me seeing the guy and screaming and the other guy coming to help me. I probably only looked away for a second, but when the guy jumped into the bush, he stands back up and he's holding a rabbit. The guy also found burning sage. He told me what sage was because I didn't even know what it was at the time. He put the rabbit down and told me it was just my imagination or that if I was being truthful, the guy ran away and I shouldn't go alone to the bathroom anymore. I go back to my campsite and my friend's dad asked me what took so long. I didn't tell him what happened. He then tells us that he wants all of us to go to the shaman's camp so we can hear the stories. So we go to the campsite and this guy was dressed to the nines. Headdress, necklace, feathers, white face paint, and no, he was not the guy in the bushes. The shaman was probably in his 40s, and he said that his father taught him everything he knows. He told us the history of the lake, and that it was his people's land, and that we took it from them. Literally being honest as can be, and not sugarcoating it for the kids. We killed them and turned their home into a lake, and that his ancestors' bones are in that lake. He then starts telling us about native legends, and he starts talking about skinwalking. He told us that some people in these tribes were so in tune with nature that they could take on the form of other animals, mainly coyotes or dogs, but they can shift into other animals too. I was starting to feel genuinely spooked, and after his whole get-together ended, I told him about what I saw in the bush. He grabbed me by the shoulder, and took me to his trailer and told me to wait outside. He came out with a single red feather and looked at my elbow and told me that I was wounded in battle and that this feather will show the skinwalkers that they should respect me and they will leave me alone. I didn't know what to do, so I took the feather and as I walk away, he shouts, they don't show themselves to everyone. I slept pretty good that night and the rest of the time we stayed after I got that feather but, like the dumbass kid that I was, I didn't treat it with respect, 
and I lost the feather not soon after I got back home. I wish I still had it. I'm not saying that skinwalkers exist, but the shaman seemed to take what I said really seriously, and I wanted to share my experience. It was around 10 o'clock at night, off a little ways from Ocean City, Maryland. It was mother, her boyfriend, my sister, and I. We were driving home from our vacation, and I asked if we could take the back roads. I always loved seeing the woods at night, and it was the scenic route. We were driving down, and although I was the one who asked for the trees, I was on my phone, texting and listening to music, we eventually came to a stretch of road that I didn't pay much attention to. It was boring, but I occasionally looked up every now and then as I'd had the entire ride. It was a straight path forward with nothing but street lights. So we were driving and driving and as we crossed under the lights, it was almost relaxing. I went into a half sleep trance. Then I suddenly woke up and everything was fine. More lights as we drove by. No one was talking. My mom's boyfriend wasn't asleep, but there were no muffled conversations. Everything seemed calm. But I had this sudden awareness. We were in the middle of the woods. It was dark and around 11.30 to midnight. And without the streetlights, you couldn't see anything but the stars. I immediately felt a very paranoid vibe and turned my phone on and listened to music. Then we entered back on another streetlight stretch, and we drove on. The strange part is, it's almost like something told me to go on my phone, as if there was a notification, but I checked and nothing was there. When I did this though, I noticed something in my peripheral. There were about four lights up ahead that were turned off, in an area where the road kind of turns. This was a fairly wooded area and you couldn't see much without light so we slowed down. I didn't pay much attention to it, but this next part sticks with me. As we slowly approached the next light that was on, something crawled out from the woods and into the light. I looked up and thought it was a deer at first, but it kept moving out. It was limping, but when it was fully emerged, what I saw was truly bone chilling. A naked, ash-white, skinny man crawled out on all fours. It stopped, and as I saw it, it turned its head toward us. Its eyes were a deep charcoal black. We sped up fast and started driving. It was not human. As we drove past it, it jumped over our car, weightlessly, defying physics. My mom's Mercedes had two sunroofs, and although it was a blur, I got a close look at it. As it passed over the car, it landed behind us and faded into the black. The scary part was, when it jumped over our car, the sunroof was open. I'm glad we got out of there. As a kid, maybe 11 years old, I was once in the forest looking for lost things. Then I came across a small pond, really a small pool in the forest. A woman was standing in the water. The water reached her knees. She was looking to the other direction and I couldn't see her face. She had white hair and some old looking clothes. They looked extremely old fashioned. She didn't turn to me, and she didn't move at all, but I could see her breathing. I came closer, and then she left the water and stood on the forest ground. As she was raising her feet from the water, I saw that her feet were backwards. I was shocked, frozen, but I freaked out and finally turned around and began to run. As I was running, 
I looked back and I could see her face. She was looking at me with this evil grin and an extremely pale face. I went home and told the story to my parents and of course they did not believe me. I've never forgotten this encounter and I was wondering if anybody else had any accounts of people having backwards feet. I went to this forest multiple times afterwards with my friends, never alone again, but I couldn't even find the pond, let alone the woman anymore. The closest thing I've found on the internet is the saguapa. As soon as I saw a picture of one, it gave me chills. The woman I saw looked exactly the same, but she was extremely pale. Everything else looks the same though. I'm fairly certain that this is what I saw, but I'm also open to any other ideas. A couple of months ago, my two-year-old son woke up crying around 3 a.m., so I brought him into bed with my wife and I. After laying there for a few minutes, he sat straight up, pointed to the corner of the room, and said, Dada, guy, guy die. My wife and I looked at each other, freaked out, and decided we would just pretend that it never happened. We bought this house from an elderly woman who lived here with her husband, and I do know that he passed away in the house some time ago. A few other strange things have happened, but I'm honestly not sure it's anything to be too worried about. Either way, that was pretty freaky. This one time, I was babysitting my cousin. She drew this really creepy picture of her friend Ellie. In this picture, Ellie had a braid wrapped around her neck and into her eyes, and she was pulling me into a closet. I asked her why she drew this, and she said, Ellie thinks you're mean. She told me she wants to hurt you, and she started crying. I mean, heck, I almost cried myself. Not much happened after that, but it was pretty terrifying. When my little niece was like four, we were in the car and randomly she goes, mommy, are we puppets? My sister was like, no, no, baby, we're not puppets. My niece thought about it for a moment and then said, I think we are. We just don't know it yet. Incredibly ominous, little child. Thanks. When my nephew was a toddler, about two years old, he would cry at night and say that there was a man in a hat in the closet who would talk to him. He was petrified and he wouldn't even sleep in his bedroom anymore. He would only sleep in his sister's room every night. My brother lives in a home that was built by our grandfather. Our grandfather had cancer when we were teens. By the time it was found, it was really too late. Near the end of his life, we brought him back home and we turned the office room into a hospital room. That same room, many years later, had become my nephew's bedroom. My brother, sister-in-law, and I were all living at the house at the time and we were all a bit startled. We didn't think it could actually be our grandfather though. I mean, he wasn't the type of man to pop out of a closet in the dark and scare the shit out of a toddler. Whatever it was that my nephew saw or thought he saw has left him afraid of the dark 
and still prefers to sleep in the same room as his sister to this day. After my brother died, we didn't tell my children because I wasn't ready. One of my sons, three years old, pointed at his picture and said, Oh, Uncle Matt, he's my ghost friend that goes to the woods. A few weeks before this, he made me shut his door every single night because he didn't want his ghost friends to go to the woods to sleep. Super creepy, but also creepily comforting. When my daughter was three or four, she came upstairs from playing in the basement when we were visiting family. She asked if it was okay to play with great grandpa, who was asking if he could play dolls with her. She had never heard the term great grandpa before, mainly because her great grandparents were long dead. Turns out my wife's grandpa died in that house. I was hanging family photos on our wall. I picked up a black and white framed photo of my father-in-law, who had passed away over 20 years prior. My husband never speaks of him, and I had never met him. My son had never seen a photo of him. As I was placing it on the wall, my three-year-old son says, that's the angel man who lives in our house. I asked him to tell me more, but he looked embarrassed and wouldn't explain further. I've never told my husband or any of his family members. I don't think they would be open to it and would probably think I was a nut. Not really creepy, but years ago, I was told I probably wouldn't be able to have kids. About four years ago, my three-year-old nephew came up to me and poked my belly a couple of times. Then he said, there's someone in there before running away. He was right and also correctly guessed the genders of both of my kids before I ever knew I was pregnant. Like I said, not really creepy, but still kind of weird. This is a really short story, but it's the creepiest thing a kid has ever said to me. My boss's kid came into my office and saw an old picture of my son. She said, Oh, you have a little boy? I told her, yes, I do, but he isn't that little anymore. Before I could even finish my sentence, she said, because he's dead. I said, no, he's alive and well. He's just older now. She then looked me dead in my eyes and said, when are you gonna die? Creepiest thing I've ever encountered. When I was younger, my brother and I were babysitting my goddaughter. We were all downstairs watching movies while lazing around on the couches when she starts to laugh hysterically and starts talking to what seemed like the stairs, repeating stuff like, that's funny. When I asked her what she was laughing at, she replied with, over there, can't you see him? The man with the green teeth sitting on the stairs. 
My brother and I grabbed her and got right out of there. I still don't like that basement. I, ha I have a five-year-old boy. My son once asked me if I knew the man that died here. We were at home. I said, uh, no? He said, I do, and went on playing. A few weeks to a month later, he came up and hugged me and said, I waited a long time for you to be my mom. One time he told me that he couldn't sleep because of all the people calling his name. I don't remember the exact conversation, but it was in a questioning context, like he thought that maybe that happened to me too. I asked him if it was scary, and he said no. Scared me, though. I called my sister and asked her to sage my house. My mom said that when I was about nine or 10 at night while I was sleeping, she would come into my room to turn my Christmas lights off. This was about late November or early December. And I apparently woke up immediately after she turned off the first set of lights and started screaming at her, what are you doing? Stop, really loudly. She turned the lights back on and I apparently went back to sleep. She asked me in the morning while I was getting ready for school if I remembered it happening, and I didn't. I'm 14 now, and still to this day, I don't remember that event happening. I'm sure that this startled the hell out of my mom, but it probably wasn't paranormal. Either way, she got a good scare. My cousin, who is 14 years younger than me, was playing in his bedroom at about age two, maybe three. Suddenly, he starts screaming and bolts out of the room into my arms. I asked him what had happened, expecting him to say that he got hurt or something. He's sobbing, saying, scary guy, scary guy. It was the middle of the day, bright and sunny, and his room was on the second floor. So I just thought something startled him and I was going to go show him that everything was okay. I tried coaxing him back to the bedroom, but he wasn't having it. I went and checked the room for myself and there was nothing spooky, no one there. I finally convinced him to come back into the room, but he insisted on being in my arms when he did. When we got to the room, I said, see? nothing to worry about but he pointed to his closet and said scary guy over there so i walked over to the closet and looked nothing so i told him there's nothing here he turns around and looks at the ceiling of the closet and that's when he starts shrieking and climbing up my body trying to get out of my arms and away from the closet i bolted out of that room with him and he calmed down I never did figure out what he saw, but that room always freaked me out from then on until the day that they finally moved. One night, I was laying in bed watching TV and I saw a ghost in my bedroom door against the blackness of the hallway. He was obviously a ghost because of how his face looked. It was really messed up. He was wearing a cowboy hat. I stared at him for a good few minutes without moving, but not really feeling scared either. Then he sort of just melted into the darkness behind him. I convinced myself I was dreaming. 
In the morning, my then three-year-old daughter came up to me and, totally unprompted, said, Mummy, did you see that man last night? The one and only time I've ever truly seen a ghost and my kid creeps me out because I couldn't convince myself it was just a dream anymore. She saw him too. This past summer, my husband and I were invited down to a friend's cabin in Kentucky, not far from the Red River Gorge. We had so much fun during the week, going hiking and riding around on the four-wheelers, things like that. Saturday was no different, and we had an awesome day out in the sun with a nice dinner planned out that evening around the fire. We were setting up outside, and I was joking around with our friend about me believing in Sasquatches and how they like to tree knock. He humored me and found a two by four for me to knock against the trees. I excitedly knocked on the trees for a good bit until I was satisfied, but I didn't receive any knocks back. Soon, unfortunately, it started to rain, and I mean an absolute downpour that ended up knocking the power out. We got the generator running, lit some candles, and cracked some windows while dinner was cooking. Now, our friend had already told us that there were numerous Indian burial grounds on his property, and we were already in the midst of ghost stories. Dinner was soon done, and we were all eating around the table when I heard what sounded like someone talking right outside the back door. I immediately stopped eating and turned to the back door and asked our friend, what was that? He smiled at me and told me I knew exactly what that was from the stories he'd been telling us prior. I got up slowly from the table and headed to the back porch and sat down on the stool. I listened closely, and the forest seemed to come alive. Amongst the whippoorwill calls, there were voices, drums, music, and soon after, there was whistling. Now, mind you, his nearest neighbor was over a mile away, and they were an elderly couple, so there was no way that they would be making all this noise. My husband and our friend soon followed outside as well, and our friend recommends knocking on the trees again. I followed his direction and began knocking as loudly as I could. Still, there was no knock back, so I walked back up to the porch and sat on my husband's lap, listening to the music. The whistling continued, and we decided to humor it and to whistle back the exact same way that it had whistled. To our absolute nervous excitement, it began to whistle and pause, waiting for our response. We whistled back for a while, and our friend decided to hit the hay with his wife. Not long after he decided to go inside, the whistling came to a stop as well as the drums, music, even the birds had gone silent. It was the eeriest feeling I had ever had, and chills ran down my spine, when far off in the distance, we heard a loud, single knock on a tree. I opened my mouth in disbelief when a dragging sound broke the silence again. The sound was something heavy, dragging what I thought were its feet through the leaves on the ground. It started off by the front gate, where the knock had come from, and kept getting closer and closer, until it finally made its way to the gravel surrounding the cabin. My husband whispered under his breath, What is that? We shined our flashlight down the side of the cabin to see nothing. My husband pushed me out of his lap, and as a last chance to try to see what the sound was coming from, grabbed our friends to see if whatever this thing was would show up on thermal. We were frozen in fear, listening to this dragging noise approach where we were, and still we could see nothing. We were so scared we bolted inside. I've never seen my husband that terrified, and I've never been that terrified. Our commotion ended up waking up our friend, and he came out of his room to ask what was wrong. We told him what had happened after he went inside, and we told him that it was close to the side of the cabin. 
With the power still being out, we crept back to his room with the window still cracked, and we could easily still hear the dragging noise walking around the cabin. He built that cabin almost 20 years ago, and he had no words. He said he'd never heard that before and had no explanation. My husband had no words. I've never been so absolutely terrified, but yet excited in all my life. The next morning I walked out onto the back porch and the only thing that stood out to me was a single large footprint in the gravel. Last summer, a good friend and I embarked on a backpacking trip through the White Mountain National Forest in New Hampshire. As fairly experienced day hikers, we felt comfortable in the Whites for our inaugural overnight trip. While planning, my buddy Ellis figured we could hike to a backcountry campsite to make our first wilderness night a little more fun. I wasn't going to disagree. Beautiful views, historic trails, and a protected night in the dry river wilderness. I was stoked to say the least. Before any hiking trip, I do a little internet search on the trails or shelters that I will be coming across. Throughout the mid to late 1900s, there were a series of these lean-tos up and down the dry river wilderness, meant for backpackers or through hikers really looking to escape the crowds in more popular areas of the forest. Though as time went on and the Forest Service had other more pressing matters, many of these shelters were dismantled except for Dry River Shelter Number 3, the last remaining shelter in this wilderness zone. On the morning of our hike, I met Ellis at the trailhead, and we set off. The sky was overcast, bringing with it a dense fog throughout the forest. The weather left us with nearly no visibility, so there went our stunning views. At least the trail consisted of prime, technical New England rock scrambling alongside the river. Ellis and I made it up to the Presidential Ridge, stopping by the Lakes of the Clouds. The hut was filled with day hikers, backpackers, and through hikers, all socializing together. We were even rewarded with some sun and a brief glimpse of the Dry River Valley on the summit of Mount Monroe before the fog rolled back in. With dwindling views and a stiff wind, Ellis and I hustled below the tree line down to the Dry River Shelter Number 3, our home for the night. Once we dropped off the ridge into the valley, we entered the wilderness zone where rangers patrolled sparingly. Time to really be alone in the wild. As we trekked into the wilderness, all signs of civilization disappeared, and the trail was densely overgrown. Although it had been raining all week, there were no footprints in the mud either. At least we would have some relaxing isolation, I figured. After about an hour or so of descending, Ellis spotted the lean-to, just as our legs were asking for relief. A gorgeous old timber structure with a well-used fire pit alongside a cold mountain river. Pristine camping. As we settled in and explored the site, I found a small, bound notebook nestled into the corner of the structure. On the cover, someone wrote, Dry River Shelter Number 3. Out of curiosity, I opened it but I found nothing more than a lone man's name scribbled onto the first page and a date. Just your standard camping log. Oddly though, the man signed the book the previous day. We saw no footprints or signs of humans or even animals. No disturbances on the trails or here at the shelter. The rain can wash away tracks, but not all signs of life. Something felt off to me. I showed it to Ellis who found it curious, but thought nothing more of the single name. He convinced me that the man was probably a hiking veteran and a professional at LNT. I bought into Ellis's thoughts on the situation to ease my mind. As the sun set, we started a roaring fire alongside the riverbank. Ellis commented how quiet the location was, having not seen another soul beyond the chirp of birds since leaving the Crawford Path. The silence was eerie, but we figured that city life had desensitized us to the wild. The sun was setting and we grew tired with the darkness. Ellis took the lean-to and I spent the night in my tent. 
Sleep came quickly after hiking over eight miles with 20 pounds on my back, but this didn't last long. A brutally sharp slapping noise woke me. The only thing I could compare the noise to would be someone swinging a two by four into a tree or snapping a thick branch. I figured it was a bear searching for our food bag hanging in a tree some 20 to 50 yards away. Nothing out of the ordinary for New Hampshire. Sleep overtook me once again, and I remember waking up to the sun rising over the peaks. I stumbled out of my tent to see Ellis also waking up slowly. As we made our morning oats and coffee, I wandered around the site again to see if I could find the marks that the bear had left. Instead, I noticed something odd. The small notebook was open. I swear that I put it back where I found it, closed and in the back corner of the shelter not open and on the floor. Hey, Ellis, were you checking out this camp log last night? Nah, man, I passed out, he said. It's not like there's anything to read in it anyway. You sure? I commented as I bent over to pick it up. The lone hiker's name was not so lonely anymore. At least 20 more names filled the pages. The lone traveler, whose name was originally on the first page, could now be found several pages deep into the notebook. I tossed it to Ellis, whose face instantly dropped the second his mind registered what he was looking at. Great, now I knew it wasn't just some dehydration delusion of the previous day. Dude, we must have been seeing things last night, he said. There's no way we missed all these names. How could we? This is when I began to tell Ellis about the slapping noise during the night. I received nothing other than instant denial. These sounds were not the result of some hooligans or backward crazies harassing us. Ellis was convinced. Rather sternly, he said, It's a bear, Jack. It's just a bear. Let's go now. And well, go we did. Ellis led us out of the site and on our way home not ten minutes later. A year has passed, and I'm still not quite sure what happened during our night at the Dry River Shelter Number 3. The memory of seeing a single name written on the front page of the notebook is so crisp in my mind. I couldn't have mistaken it. Could I have mistaken the noises I heard and the new additions to the book? Ellis feels the same way about the whole scenario. What do you think? Could we have just been too dehydrated and delusional and saw the same thing independently? Or were we not welcomed by the New Hampshire wilderness? In 2001, a couple of days after my mother gave birth to my brother, she brought him home from maternity. I was seven at the time. My brother's cot was in my parents' bedroom, right next to their bed. That first night of my newborn brother being home, my dad was working a night shift, so I went to sleep next to my mother, as I usually did when my dad would be working nights. Around two or three in the morning, my mom and I both wake up at the same time and look at each other, confused as to why we woke up, realizing that my brother was still fast asleep or at least wasn't crying or making a noise. We listened for any other noise that might have woken us up, but nothing. Not a minute later, this whooshing loud noise fills the room and we feel a strong breeze or wind. Then we hear the whooshing sound again, this time closer to my baby brother's cot. My mom jumps out of bed, freaking out that somehow the window was left open and a bird got in. Now that whooshing sound was exactly like wings flapping, but it was more like massive wings were flapping, not a regular bird. And the gust of wind it created was also massive. Lights go on, my brother is awake now, but was not scared by the noise or the wind. He was just kind of looking around. My mom starts looking for birds when I point out that the window is in fact closed. She still makes me get up and have a look around with her for anything that could explain it. 
We had a chat afterwards about it, and she told me that as soon as she got over the shock, she heard a voice telling her, it's okay, just as she was about to check up on my brother. In the moment, she assumed I was trying to calm her down. But when I denied it, she realized that the voice didn't sound like me at all. I also heard the it's okay, and it sounded genuinely reassuring. It's worth adding that we heard and felt the winged thing come, but we never heard or felt it leave. We stayed up the rest of the night, waiting for something else to happen, but it never did. While the noise and all scared us initially, we both felt relaxed, relieved, content, and happy all at the same time. It's hard to describe the feeling. Mind you, the whole thing happened in like 10 seconds, but that weird feeling stayed with us the rest of the day. When my dad came home and was told the story, he was genuinely worried, and my mom just told him that it's okay. He has nothing to worry about. At his puzzled look that my mom hadn't joined him in being worried, she just said, trust me, I have a good feeling about this. Now, I don't know why she said it like that, but at the same time, I completely understood it. It's been a long time since this happened, but it's still very clear in both mine and my mom's memories. I have tried to look this up through the years, but came up empty. I would love to get an idea of what it was. So here's my story. I always thought that I believed in these kinds of things, but now that it's happened to me, I'm trying my hardest to rationalize it away. Unfortunately, I can't. I just want to start off by saying that I am 37 years old, and I have never experienced anything like this in my life, and I hope never to experience it again. This happened three days ago. It was 11.30 at night, and I was taking my dog out to go to the bathroom. My boyfriend and I live on about four acres of land. We have an overgrown field in the distance. It's somewhere near the house, but not super close. I was carrying one of those spotlight flashlights. It's so powerful that you can see the beam shoot through the night sky. My dog and I were getting close to the field, so I decided to scan it with a flashlight. What I saw next still terrifies me. I saw this creature walking through the field. It had a human-shaped head, but the eyes were nothing like I had ever seen. They were so big that it took up a majority of its face. They glowed in a way that I have never seen. It was a piercing glow. I know that flashlights can create a certain type of reflective glow, but this was different. It was almost like the light was shooting out of its eyes. I live in a wooded area, so I have come into contact with many animals at night. This was not a set of eyes like I've ever seen on any animal here. It's weird because I don't recall seeing a mouth, but that could have been because I was so fixated on its abnormally large eyes that I wasn't paying attention to its lower face. Its eyes had this shocked but evil look to them. That expression really stood out to me because it was so eerie. Now let's get to the body. It was somewhat human shape, but it had abnormally long extremities. Even though the overgrown field covered some of its body, I could still tell the shape of it. The arms were too long for its body. I checked out how tall the overgrown grass was the next day, and based on that, I estimated that the creature was about six feet tall. The way it walked terrified me. It was facing me and walking sideways while staring at me. I have to admit that I got so scared I lowered the flashlight to the ground, but then I got the nerve to raise it back up after a few seconds. It had made its way down the field a little more, but it was still walking sideways and staring at me with those horrifying eyes. Needless to say, I took my dog inside after that and had a mini freak out. I've done a lot of research online 
and I cannot figure out what that thing was. I just know that it wasn't an animal or a human, and I hope that I never see it again. I haven't really spoken to anyone about this, other than my boyfriend and his brother. His brother gave off the impression that he thought I was crazy, and laughed it off. So, I've not said anything to anyone since. It's been driving me crazy ever since I saw it. This happened in March of 2021. Where I live in England, there's a lot of countryside. At the time it happened, I was driving down a small country road that was parallel to a main road. Just a large field and bush on the other side next to the main road to separate them. I was talking to my boyfriend, and I noticed this very tall human-like figure at the side of the road. It was extremely skinny, like it was skin and bones and nothing else. It didn't appear to have any clothes on, it had pale skin, and it looked really unhealthy. I didn't really see its face, but from the quick glance I got, it looked like it had indistinguishable facial features like it had been blurred in Photoshop or something. It crossed the road onto the field in front of me extremely quickly, and then disappeared into an open field. I slowed right down and looked back into the field. It was mid-evening, so it was getting dark, but you could still see. There was nothing it could have hid behind. The grass was too short to hide in, and there was no way that any human could have ran the entire length of that field to the bush on the other side in such a short amount of time. Whatever it was, just vanished into thin air. My boyfriend told me to stop the car, but I was terrified and everything in me told me to continue driving, so I never stopped to check it out. I'm not sure whether that was a mistake or not. I don't know why it's terrified me so much, but I can't stop thinking about it and it's driving me crazy. I'm searching for an explanation. I know it may be unlikely, but has anyone else ever seen something like this? If so, do you have any idea what it was? My only explanation is something paranormal. If it were human, how did it just vanish like that? I would love to know. For some background, I live in the California foothills. My parents and I moved into this house from the city in late 2017, after it had been sitting empty for over a year. The day we moved in, my mother and I arrived first to clean, while my father and brother drove the moving truck. Right off the bat, I was uneasy, but I tried to write it off. The property felt heavy, is the only way I can describe it. Some people on here describe the feeling of being watched inside their homes, but I had that feeling any time I stepped outside. We were going to sweep and mop the floors, dust the baseboards and window sills, when I started noticing this white granular powder all along the baseboards and the window sills and the doorways. I immediately told my mother, who told me not to worry about it and just sweep it up. By the time I had swept up every room and cleaned off the window sills, I was certain that it was salt, and a lot of it. But fine, whatever, the people that lived here before were superstitious, alright, I can live with that. We unpacked the truck over the next week. I was setting up my room when the next bizarre events started happening. Knocking on the windows, always quick raps that sounded like someone knocking with their knuckles. It would happen so often, on all the windows in the house, but when you would turn, no one would be there. You'd go outside, and no one would be around the house. This only escalated. My brother would stay up late in his room on his computer every night. He liked to game with his friends until early in the morning. He does not spook easily, but on more than one occasion I would wake up to him shaking me awake, terrified saying something massive on two legs was walking around outside his bedroom window, which he would have open at night. 
He said it would walk right up to his bedroom window and stop. And when he would look toward the sound, he could hear it scrambling away. I never saw it with my own eyes and neither did he, but the motion lights outside would be activated every single time, leading to the woods near the back of our property. I know what you're probably thinking. All of this up to this point can be explained away rationally. A crazy person living in the woods, some neighbor messing with us for whatever reason. Well, that was what I told myself too, so I could sleep a little easier at night. And then the banging started. It was so loud, and it would sound like it was coming from everywhere at once. The walls would literally vibrate, picture frames rattling right off the walls. It was like something massive, stronger than any crazy person, was pounding on the exterior walls of the house, always late at night, and always in more places than just one. I could never pinpoint the source directly. My brother and I would stumble out of our bedrooms petrified, and my mom would lead us to her room where we would stay after that. My dad would walk the perimeter of our property with his gun, but he never found anything. No footprints, no people, nothing. This happened for probably six months, and every time a major event would happen, my dad would walk the perimeters with his rifle and come back with nothing. We felt like we were going insane. And then, suddenly, it just stopped. The mutilated animals stopped appearing. I stopped feeling like I was being watched any time I would go outside. My dogs stopped being so on edge any time I took them out. And the property itself seemed to get lighter, like it finally took a deep breath after holding it for so long. I genuinely have no explanation or even a clue as to what that creature, being, or entity even was. I'm just glad it seems to have moved on. Hopefully it didn't stop because it moved in. So back in 07, I was eight years old. My grandparents and I lived up on a mountain in northern Georgia in Floyd County, and our property was against the Bartow County line. It's a warm September night, just a couple of days after my birthday. I'm up in my room playing Call of Duty on my Wii, and my grandpa walks in and asks if I can take the trash out before it gets too cold. I say sure and pause my game and slip my shoes on. I walk out into the garage and open the garage door to throw the bag into my grandpa's truck. I turn on the light on the outside of the garage and walk to my grandpa's truck. Me being eight years old at the time, I was afraid of the dark, so I kind of sped walked and threw the bag in and hoped to make it. However, I did not make it, and I heard the bag land on the ground behind the truck. My head drops and my heart starts to pound for some reason. Like I know that if I go behind the truck, something will get me. You know, the basic eight-year-old paranoia. So I run to the back of the truck, pick up the bag and toss it in, and turn around to go back into the garage when I see something. The way my driveway is, it turns off a gravel road, then curves to the left and up a hill. The hill smooths out a little bit, but doesn't level off completely. Right where the hill gets less steep, I see a dark figure just standing there. In the light coming from the garage, I can just make out its silhouette. It appears to be a person at first, but then my eyes adjust and I can vaguely make out hair covering its entire body. I stand there frozen with fear, like if I turn my back, it's gonna sprint up and get me. So I hesitantly walk backwards toward the garage while keeping my eyes fixed on it. And it seemed that every step I took, it took one also. I finally reached the hole where the garage door is placed and ran as fast as I could inside. When I got inside, I ran into the living room for my grandpa. And I say, Grandpa, get the gun. There's something in the driveway. It's big and it's walking on two feet. I don't know what it is, but it scares me. 
So my grandpa got the gun and we go outside on the front porch, which is a good 40 yards closer to the part of the hill that I saw it on. And it's not there. My grandpa says, you sure you saw something? I don't say anything. I just nod. He drops the gun from the shoulder and says, come on, you haven't put the new trash bag in the can yet. We both turn around and walk back inside. Several hours go by and nothing else happens, until about 1 a.m. I wake up from having a nightmare of what I saw. I lay in my bed and look at my curtained windows, and I can see that the front porch light is on. I find that safer because it acts as a sort of nightlight for me, so I'm laying there looking at my window when I see a huge shadow walk right in front of my window on the outside, and I mean huge. The window sat about two feet off the ground, was about four feet tall, and was about two and a half feet from the ceiling. And this shadow was tall enough to cast a shadow big enough to where it looked like someone was sliding a wall past the window. I could hear the boards creaking out on the front porch and could see how wide this thing was from a side view. This thing, whatever it was, was at least two feet wide from the side and it was absolutely huge. I didn't want to go get my grandparents because I didn't want them to get mad for waking them if there was nothing there. So I just watched this thing walk back and forth past my window, and before too long, somehow I fell asleep. Fast forward to the summer between my sophomore and junior year in high school. I had moved off the mountain but was still going to the same school. Anyway, like a week before school got out, my best friend Kevin and I thought that it might be a good idea to go up to the mountain and to see if we could find this thing. Maybe it was still there. Without hesitation, I jumped at the opportunity. So the following weekend, after school ended, I met up with him and we brought some camping gear, along with some food, and a 30 odd 6 I tell him we can camp out at the house that I saw this thing at, and he agreed that that was the best place to start. So we make it to the night, and he's like, let's get out and walk around. I say, okay. So we both get out of the tent. I instantly felt like I was being watched. I shouldered the rifle, and I felt the adrenaline filling my veins. Kevin put his hand on the barrel and lowers the end of the gun to the ground. Don't do that, he said. You'll make me nervous. So we start walking around the woods. We find some small game paths and hear a few noises but we don't really find anything. So we both look at each other and decide it's not worth it, so we start walking back to the tent. This walk will take us at least about 30 minutes. On our way back, we can hear things in the woods that sound like tree knocks and whoops. We get about 100 yards from the property that we're camping out on, and suddenly a rock flies through the woods and lands within 10 feet of Kevin and I. Then it's like it just unloaded on us, Rocks were landing all around us with almost no time in between impacts. We hear all sort of whoops and hollers coming from different directions, almost like we were being surrounded, hunted. I tell Kevin to run, that I'd be right behind him. So we start running toward the property and hear the trees snapping behind us. I stop for a split second to raise the gun and fire a warning shot into the air. And then... All went silent. Kevin stops just in the clearing of the property and looks back at me. I looked back at him and we both run onto the property and book it out of there as fast as that pickup truck we drove would take us. I haven't been up there since and I don't intend to return. This is a story from when I was growing up in Northern Kentucky in the 90s. I would have been right around 10, maybe a little older. I'm in my 30s now, but I vividly remember this happening and I still think about it all the time. My best friend lived with his grandparents for a bit on several acres of land in Walton, Kentucky, and I spent almost every weekend there. They never really did much with the land. It remained relatively cleared, but there were no farms or structures on it. 
They had a horse stable near the house, but that was it. My friend had received a go-kart for his birthday, so we were out driving it around on the open land. It was just the two of us, and we were having a blast riding this thing around. It was getting close to dusk, and we knew we were going to have to pack it in pretty soon. We came to a stop, and the engine cut out, and almost at the same time, both of us had this really strange feeling come over us. We felt like we were being watched by something. It's weird how our lizard brains can still even process something like this, but we both agreed that there was just this weird, overbearing feeling. We hadn't heard his grandpa's truck, and we were too far out to be seen from the house, so we started looking around. We were in an open field in the middle of their land, and it was surrounded by trees and tall brush. But something caught my eye first, and I got my friend to look in that same direction. In the brush, we could see a long, almost black shape sitting very still. I know at this point in the story, most of you are thinking Bigfoot. I can say I remember things being dead silent. Even now, I sometimes wonder if it was something else we saw. But all I remember is thinking that it was a giant black wolf. I would guess it was maybe 200 feet away from us. And it was sitting perfectly still. But to me anyway, it looked furry. I couldn't make out any other features, like ears or eyes. But I swear, this was what was making us feel watched. It's like when you see a cat getting ready to pounce. That's what it felt like when we were looking at this thing. We were both getting really spooked at this point. The sun was getting down low behind the tree line, and one of us was going to have to jump out and pull start the engine back up. We were whispering about what it was that was watching us. Honestly, I forget which one of us jumped out and started the cart back up, but when we looked back at where the black shape had been, it was gone. The go-kart didn't have any lights, so we drove as fast as we could back to his grandparents' house and we told them what we saw. His grandpa said we probably just saw a coyote or maybe a boar, but this shape was long and low and, I don't know, Coyote and boar, they just don't sit well in my head with what I saw. Not to mention it was pitch black and very furry. Every few years I think about this story, and I've read that there are no wolves in Kentucky anymore. I think I've just convinced myself it was a coyote or something, but the memory has stuck in my head all this time. Nothing else ever happened on his grandparents' land aside from a really bad car accident a few years later, and some missing chickens, but again, a coyote would explain that. And every once in a while, the horses would get really riled up at night. We would go camping on the land and fishing a lot, and we had a lot of fun around there. Anyway, this is my short little spooky story. I wish it had more bite to it, but it's 100% what happened. What do you think we saw? My grandfather lived in a very rural area in Nepal, and most of the people were farmers, so was he. Since there was no automated water system, they would have to take turns to switch water to their land, and sometimes this would happen at night. One night, there was a full moon, and even though it was midnight, everything was visible with the naked eye. As usual, he went to the farm to switch the water flow from one section to another. Everything went as normal, and he sat down for a quick smoke session. He saw a small baby goat near the farm, which was very strange, because there were no houses anywhere near, and it's not normal for goats to just roam around by themselves. He thought he would take it to the village, and whoever it belonged to could claim it in the morning. He has the goat on his back, and his hands are grabbing onto its legs. He was walking up the hill, when suddenly he hears a whisper. Such a pretty moon, making the night so beautiful. The goat talked like a human being. He threw the goat to the ground and started running up. He looked back as he was crossing the hill and there was no goat. He ran all the way home 
and he told us that he smoked the whole packet of cigarettes and didn't sleep all night. Last night, I woke up at around 2 a.m. I heard this soft yelling and was confused at first as to why somebody was out. Then, as I listened more, I realized there was a pattern to it. I wanted to get up to the window and see who was making that sound, thinking that they may just be a drunk person walking around the parking lot. But there was this overwhelming sense of dread that came over me, like, if I looked outside, I would be drawn to go outside, and if I went outside, I would never come back. This rhythmic whooping continued on for easily 20 minutes, and then stopped altogether. It was not an animal, I know this for sure. I have had paranormal experiences before, so maybe I'm easily spooked but I think I was being lured outside. And even though it sounded human, I didn't get up to look. Now it's the morning after and I can't shake this feeling. Does this sound familiar to anyone else? Some kind of hunting practice for a known humanoid or cryptid? As a note, I live in an area of owls and wild birds and I hear them consistently throughout the week. I know what they sound like. I don't have coyotes or any big cats in my area. I listen to owls outside my window often, and I can tell you that this was something different. I don't know how to explain it, but it almost sounded like a human trying to imitate an owl. I only immediately dismissed it as being a wild animal because it was so unlike anything I've ever heard. I would love to know what it could be.